There you are, you little blinder! <laughs> Hold on a moment. What is going on here? Much obliged, Pastor Newton. If you just hold him, I'll give him the kind and he deserves. As a point of personal privilege, sir, no one shall be whipped in my presence. Then you deal with him. What has he done wrong? Sir, fighting with the other boys, disobedience, swearing. They tipped over me stall. Oh, sir, he's a bad seed. These are serious charges. I'm serious, sir. Please, stand back and let me give him the kind he deserves. Not in my presence, Mr. Chapman. Fine. He's your problem. You deal with him. The wash man's of the little cad. Huh. Thank you, sir. Fighting, eh? Swearing? These are serious charges. You're Mrs. Watson's oldest, aren't you? Aye, she's me stepmom. Hmm. Well, I was about to go inside for a spot of tea. Would you like to join me? Might there be any biscuits? Well, there might be. Let's go see. So, fighting and swearing. You wouldn't understand. No? How could you? you? You're the poor sin and all. I think I might understand much better than you think. I was once a little boy myself, and I think uh, by the time I was your age, I'd been expelled from two different schools for fighting and swearing. You? Never. Hmm. Yes, I wasn't always a church parson, you know. In fact, I've been a great many different things in life, and I've probably done things far worse than fighting and swearing. Like what? Well, I was a cabin boy on a ship. I was a ship's captain later on. I was even a slave for a while. Nah, sir. You're letting me on. No, I'm not. Would you like to hear a little of my story? Well, are there more biscuits? <laughs> there might be, yes, and more tea as well. Of course, it was all a very long time ago, you understand, but I don't think that little boys have really changed that much, do you? I remember my dear mother as if it were only a few weeks ago. She taught me to pray. She taught me to read by reading me the scriptures. She died when I was only six. My father was a merchant seaman, a captain. While I'm sure that he loved me in his own way, I don't recall ever feeling loved by him. He soon remarried a beautiful young woman who bore him other children. She wasn't terribly interested in me, and so he was away at sea, and I ended up in boarding school. It wasn't long before I was expelled from that school for the same sort of trouble you've been in. You mean fighting? I am general disobedience. When I was young, I had this hot core of anger inside of me that burned all the time, and it was out of control. I couldn't control my actions always. I... You do understand, don't you? It wasn't long before I was expelled from the next school for the same thing, and my father decided that the only thing to be done was to take me to sea, and so I went on a ship with him when I was 11. We served as cabin boys, carrying and cleaning and doing whatever any grown-up sailor wanted done. But that burning core of anger was still inside me, and when it would burn, I would always end up in trouble. Daughter, suck on that, young Master Newton. Maybe you'll think twice about splinging blasphemies around in me galley. I took my anger out on the other boys, the ones who were smaller than I 
ended up in trouble again. But in spite of the trouble I got into, I grew into a man aboard merchant ships, and I became an able-bodied seaman. Ship leaves next Wednesday for Jamaica. We can use you if you'll sign on. Aye, sir, I will. I'll be visiting in Kent for a few days, but I can be back for Wednesday. Little did I know how those few days in Kent would affect the rest of my life, for it was there, staying with friends of my mother, that I met the love of my life, my Polly. Her name was Mary, Mary Catlett, and almost from the first time I saw her, my heart was a captive. My secret nickname for her was Polly, my dear Polly, my beloved. She was a little younger than I, and her beautiful smile melted my heart and made a permanent mark upon my soul. Mr. Newton, I shall speak plainly. We loved your dear mother and held in the highest regard. Mary is too young yet for any decision. But her father and I do not object to an understanding, provided yes. provided that when you return from your voyages, we will see some signs of stability and of prospect. Prospect? Prospect for living, Mr. Newton, is of great importance. Yes, I shall keep that in mind, Mrs. Catlett, and I shall return. Now I went back to sea with a goal in mind, to make my way to find advancement, to make my fortune, so that I could return and marry my dear Polly. The beautiful memory of her smile, of her sweet face, got me through many long watches and lonely nights at sea. But even the memory of her smile could not keep me from trouble. That hot anger burned inside me still and would boil over at times. No! Send him to the surgeon! Then you, Newton? You're on report. Reduce rations for a week. And of course, I was a seaman at sea, no different from any other. When at port, I joined heartily in the sins that waited any sailor. But not all temptations were in port. Ah, you're a fool if you believe all that blather. All this can be explained by reason and science. Ah, there's no God up there. The rationalists have it, right? Is that what you do when you're off duty? Read philosophers? Aye. There's lots of hours at sea, John. Lots of time to think. Hobbes, Voltaire, they make more sense than a pack of priests mumbling Latin. Nothing but superstition to control the rest of us. You should read all. It's all Lonia's book, Leviathan. And so I too became a sailor philosopher of sorts. Spinoza and Hobbes often made quite a deal of sense, and just as often made me doubt the simple faith of my childhood. One night at sea, I fell asleep over a book, and I had the strangest dream, one that would come back to me again and again throughout my life. As long as you preserve this ring, you will be successful and happy. But should you lose it or part with it, you must only expect sorrow and distress.
You believe that ring is magic? As long as I preserve and keep it, I should be happy and successful. Ha <laughs> ha, are you naughty boy? What a simpleton. You believe anything you're told, don't you? It seemed right. What's right about it? Some stranger hands you a ring. Tells you it's magic. It's a talisman. And you believe him? What a poltroon! Seriously, John, how can you buy such clap crap? To ascribe magical powers to a wee piece of metal shaped in a circle? Why, well, I'd be ashamed to admit such superstitions to another man. Don't you understand that by subscribing to such superstitions, it saps your own human powers of reason? Throw it away. Go on. Throw it away. Create your own fate. Take control of your own destiny. Go on. Throw it away. Go on. Go on. Show you're a man. I brought it back for you. <gasps> no. If you were to be entrusted with this ring again, you would soon bring yourself to the same distress. You are not able to keep it. But I will preserve it for you. And whenever it is needful, I will produce it on your behalf. It wasn't long before that voyage was nearing its end and I would be able to return to Kent to visit my Polly. As the ship turned home, all my thoughts had turned to her in the prospect of again seeing her sweet face. But it was not to be. Less than five miles from her house, I encountered a press gang. These were the days of an impending war with France, and the Navy needed fresh men all the time. Press gangs roamed the country, authorized to virtually kidnap a lightly young lad and press him into the service of His Majesty's Navy. Run! It's a press gang! Oh, 
He's awake. Welcome to His Majesty's Navy. What's your name, son? John Newton. See? All right. Day out of Liverpool. You was the last conscript brought on board. Here, drink something. It'll help you feel better. HMS Orange, newly commissioned man of war, under the command of Captain Carteret. We're on our way to France to defend king and country. We're always fighting with France or Spain, ever since Eve bit that apple. I was on my way to propose to my beloved. Oh, it's a shame. Four years will be out, I expect. Four years? Aye. Captured, carried away from my love against my will, imprisoned at sea. Each day on the ocean took me further from Polly and increased my resentment. Sailors, we've all got our crosses to bear. Leave me alone. The smoldering anger that had always burned in me was now a fire of resentment. I obeyed orders. I did my job, but I did so with a sullen attitude. In my mind, God himself had cheated me. Why did you do this to me? Am I such a sinner that you had to single me out for special punishment? I have nothing to do with you. But I was no fool. I soon perceived that I had a greater chance of liberty if I was promoted. And so I began to focus all my rage into hard work and efforts to please the officers. Not because I had any true respect for them, but because I saw it as my opportunity for a change. So I started to work hard. Aye, sir. And I showed officers great respect. Newton. Sir. Good job, Seaman. Thank you, sir. At least to their faces. You wish to see me, sir? Aye, Mr. Newton. Your father is a merchant captain. Aye, sir. I have heard good things of him. He's written me asking that I consider you for advancement. I've spoken to the mate, and he says that you have been an exemplary seaman. I try my best, sir. That's the attitude. What would you say to being promoted to midshipman? Aye, sir. I would like that very much. Didn't think you'd refuse. So be it. You are promoted to midshipman. Being a midshipman meant that I was a sort of apprentice officer, and I was set over my former mates. Come on, you sluggards, get to work! 
Aye, sir. Set the topsail. Lay the shrouds. Sails mended, seamen. While I behaved with perfect form to my superiors, the rage inside me often was taken out on the sailors who were now under me, much as I had once bullied smaller children. You call that a knot, seaman? Aye, sir, figure of eight. It's a floppy mess. Take it apart and start again. Aye, sir. Fall back and there'll be no rations for you tonight. Aye, sir. After some months at sea patrolling the channel and even fighting skirmishes with French ships, We had to put back into Plymouth for repairs, and then it was that I had my chance. Mr. Newton, while we have repairs, I'm going to permit a rotation of shore leave to the seamen. I'm assigning you to go ashore with them and supervise to make sure none of them desert. Aye, sir. It was as if the master had left the cat to guard the cream. I'll be back at sunset. Anyone not here and ready to return to the ship should be counted as deserting and shall feel the lash. Aye, Aye sir. sir. All right, off with you. Here at last was my chance to go see my Polly. I wasn't much on thinking things through in those days and it didn't really occur to me that desertion would catch up with me. Desertion from His Majesty's Navy. Mr. John Newton, charged with desertion from His Majesty's Royal Navy. A charge punishable by death when found guilty by court martial, or lesser punishment by a ship's captain as defined by Article 16 of the Articles of War. Captain, what shall be the punishment? He shall be demoted from his present position and stripped of all rank. He shall be tied to the mainmast and administered twelve lashes with the cat. Let each of you witness what happened to those who deserve His Majesty's service. No one shall speak a word to Mr. Newton for seven days. No one shall show him favor. No one shall share any ration with him other than the bread and water assigned by the galley master. Are these instructions clear? Aye, sir. Aye, sir. You got your own now, don't you, Mr. High and Mighty? More than what you deserve. Enjoy your meal, sir.
ceiling out. You can sleep in a hammock from now on. You up swabbing the deck in no time. Mr. Jensen? Pass the word to Mr. Jensen. Mr. Smythe? Pass the word to Mr. Smythe. Mr. Newton. I said Mr. Newton, sir. Pass the word to Mr. Newton. The captain had conscripted two gunners from a passing ship. Maritime law required that he replace them with able-bodied seamen so that the civilian ship would not be short-handed. This gave Captain Carteret the perfect opportunity to get rid of some troublemakers. Able-bodied seamen, my ass. Two of you were scurvy and one barely recovered from the scourge. Well, I can tell you, you'll feel the cat again. You disobey on this ship. Aye, Aye sir. sir. This is a slave ship. We'll be 18 months on the Triangle. Serve well, and you'll be rewarded. Serve poorly, and you'll be punished. Understood? Aye, Aye sir. sir. Dismissed. I came to like many of the sailors on the Levant. The old rage still burned inside me. Now it was directed all at the captain. That's a sloppy bit of work there, Mr. Newton. That's the way you worked on the orange. No wonder you were flogged. Aye, listen up, mates. We've come with a little song about old Mr. Phelps up here. Did you ever see the likes since you've been to sea? Let the good ship rock. A panty-legged captain with a bent back knee wobbling down the dock. Wobbling down the dock. Let the good ship roll and rock. Better call a cobbler to cobble up the wobbler. We'll anchor at the Banan Islands in Sierra Leone tomorrow. I'll need a crew of three to row me in to meet with the trader. Harkness, Smythe, and, and Newton. The following day, we'll sail to Cockerell Bay where we'll load the cargo. I like that. None could think about staying here, he could. You like what you see then? Do I? I'll bet you on trader there lives like a king. What's not to like? What do you think, Newton? Ah, uh, you both are daft. It might be nice for a while. I want to get back to England. I want to see my Polly. Smythe, Harkness, make ready the boat. Newton, you stay here with me. Mr. Campbell, this is Mr. Newton, the young man I was telling you about. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. <laughs> you won't be so pleased once you understand the deal. I've traded you, Mr. Newton. You're to stay here as a servant. How do you like them apples, Mr. Funny Man? So you've met a lash. You'll meet again soon enough if you don't serve well. 
They're my property now, Newton. And there's no way off this island without me knowledge or me permission. So don't you go be getting any bright ideas. You have to be a servant for me, wife. Self-aware. Do as you're told. Your life will be much easier. But you buck against, and you'll find out just how hard a life can be. You guard, take him to pay high. She's always wanted to have a white man as a slave. Now she's got one. He is not much to look at, is he? Give him a mat and chain him behind the house. First, we must break him. My defiance, my sins, had all caught up with me. I was a slave. They gave me only a little to eat for days. Just enough to drink to keep me alive. Take the chains off today. You are pay I slave. Do you understand? You must do exactly as she bids. If you try to run away, we will hurt you and chain you. If you disobey, you will be whipped. If you try to run away twice, we will kill you slowly in a way that will make you wish for death to come. Do you understand? Yeah. Now go and serve your mistress. No problem. Ah, my little white man. Oh, you must be so terribly hungry. How could you have treated my little white man so badly? Here, let me give you some food. You would like something to eat, wouldn't you? I'm sure you would. I'm sure you are starving. The food will taste so good. She worked me like a mule. She seemed to take particular delight in watching me suffer, often making me do chores that were simply pointless. Ah, very good. Now that you have placed the logs here, put them back and place them exactly where you found them. <laughs>
You are useless, even as a slave. For a long time, I felt nothing but hunger and despair. I could never forget that I was the lowest form of life on the island. Even the native slaves had thatched huts to live in, while I had to sleep on the ground under the stars. On the other hand, Campbell and P.I. lived in a great brick house at the center of the island. I was seldom allowed in the big house, and then only to do menial labor. But as long as I obeyed P.I.'s abusive commands, they fed me a little, and I regained some strength in mind as well as body. One night I lay looking at the expanse of the heavens. I began to try and see how many constellations I could identify, how many stars I could name. This became a nightly game that became a private area of freedom for me. And I began to dream again of my dear Polly, my beautiful Polly. I wonder if I will ever see her again. Then one night, it seemed to me that a group of stars formed a circle, a ring, a constellation I had never seen before and never since. It may have been my eyes playing a trick, or perhaps a planet had wandered into an unusual position visible from this latitude. But that night, I could indeed see a ring, a ring like the one in my dream. You're not able to keep it. but. I will preserve it for you, and whenever it is needful, I will produce it on your behalf. During the days when P.I. was in a mood, I would work very hard. But then there would be hours of boredom when there was nothing to do. One day, I found a small lime tree growing near the village that seemed much like me, beaten and starving, despairing of life. I adopted that little tree as my own and began to take care of it, to water and to fertilize it. I found other seedlings and planted them in what became my own little garden. One day, Campbell had me move heavy crates into the big house. I was alone for a few moments, and there I came upon a dusty old geometry book. I took it and hid it under my mat. I began in my spare time to work geometry problems, scratching diagrams in the sand. Using the sun and the shadow of my little lime tree, I calculated the latitude and longitude of the islands we were on, which were commonly called the Banana Islands. Just like the stars, like the little lime tree, it gave me something to focus on, a space that was mine and mine alone. There was little I could do with the knowledge, but the exercise did much to keep my mind occupied and sharp. One day, when I was tending to my little garden and passing the time with equations written in the sand, Mr. Campbell and P.I. walked down the path and caught sight of what I was doing. Newton, what are you doing, man? Are you growing your own limes? <laughs> I was terrified that P.I., as cruel as she was, would make me destroy my little place of sanity. <laughs> well, who knows? 
Maybe one day before those trees are full grown, you can sail back to England and you can be the captain of your own boat. Then you can come back here and enjoy the fruits of your labors. <laughs> then again, perhaps you will become the king of Poland. <laughs> <laughs> What is this? Do you understand the mathematics? Yes, sir. I taught myself. Oh. It might not be a complete waste after all. Here are a set of equations. I'd like for you to solve them. What is it? A test? Aye, if you will. I want to see just how good you are with these mathematics. Sit down, sit down. I'm in need of a clerk to manage my factory in Kittim. There are not very many people in Sierra Leone who understand numbers. Factory? Aye. It's my slave trading post. It's where the Bombo bring in slaves from the interior and make them ready for transport to the West Indies. My brother runs the factory, but he's in need of someone who can keep the accounts. You will go there. You will serve him now. The guard will take you. At Kittum, my life changed dramatically. I had new, clean clothes to wear. Angus Campbell treated me well, almost as an equal. Bombo treated me with respect, inviting me to their feasts. I thought of Polly often. Before long, I had given up any hope of ever returning to England. My circumstance had changed from one of daily despair one of comfort. I had all I needed, food, shelter, clothing, respect, and even women. Thoughts of England faded, and my life in Kittim began to envelop every part of my being. The other settlers even had an expression for it. They called it going native. But then came the day 
when my entire world would suddenly change again, as if a lightning bolt had struck. Mr. Newton, I'm not here to see you. Mr. New, Mr. John New. Yes. I'm Archibald Gopher, captain of the HMS Greyhound, out of Liverpool. Uh, welcome, Captain Gopher. You here to pick up a shipment? Not exactly. You see, I'm here to take you home. Me? What are you talking about? Your father commissioned me to find you and bring you back to England, whatever the cost. I've been stopping at every trading post south of the Canaries searching for you. And finally, here you are. My father. Mr. Nutter! There she is, the Greyhound. After this, we've got two more ports of call to pick up ivory and beeswax. And then we shall set sail for Liverpool. And for you, home. Captain Gotha, a month ago I would have told you I had no hope or even dream of seeing England again. I was prepared to live out my days here. Perhaps marry a native. Even have my grave right here in West Africa. If I believed in God, I would say his hand had brought you here. Believe it. Where else can it be? So I began my journey home, not as a crewman, but as a passenger on the Greyhound. Freed of the duties I was used to, I had many hours at sea to think, to think about my life, to think about life itself. It was during these long hours of leisure that I discovered a book, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akimpis. I began reading it, not as a meditational work, but as a work of fiction, an entertainment to pass the time. But as I read, the involuntary suggestion came to me. What if these words were true? What if the faith of this long dead writer was in fact a reality that I simply did not understand? I could not bear the inference as it related to myself. Dimly remembered scripture verses came unbidden to my mind, especially fearful passages that speak of the judgment of those who know the way of truth, but then depart from it. What if I were one of them? What if the faith I had abandoned was in fact the driving reality of the universe? What if God's hand had in fact been the moving force that brought me to this point? Brought Gotha to Sierra Leone to rescue me? What if I had turned my back on the very God who sought to save me? I was so caught up in my own thoughts and meditation that I had not even been aware of the storm that had engulfed us.
I thought back then on that powerful recurring dream that had haunted my life. I will preserve it for you. And whenever it is needful, I will produce it on your behalf. We had survived the most terrifying storm of my life at sea. But more than that, I had a glimmer of new hope, a spark of faith in my heart. In my darkest moment, I discovered a chance of reconciliation with a God that I had long dismissed as mere fiction. That was March 10th, 1748, a day that I would mark for the rest of my life as the day of my conversion. There is little doubt that our very cargo had saved us. The beeswax and the dyer's wood we carried being both lighter than water. The Greyhound was so swamped with water that we surely would have sunk if it were not for the flotation of the cargo itself. But was God's hand not present even in this detail? As we limped back toward England, crippled with only a few sails, I spent most of my time reading the scriptures, meditating, and praying to the Lord for mercy and instruction. I began to see my life in a different perspective. The burning anger that had driven me as a younger man was now faded. I began to see that my entire life was that of the parable of the prodigal son, not in a figurative way, as most people understand it, but in the most literal reality. Land ho! We sighted land on April 7th, the Irish island of Tory. The next day, we landed at Swilly. Finally, I was safely home after misadventures that seemed like a storybook. So, did you see your father? No. See, God's ways are very strange. You see, the day I arrived in Liverpool, I discovered that my father had shipped out only the day before for Canada. He'd been appointed governor of York's Fort in Hudson Bay Colony. I never saw him again. How sad. Did he know that you were saved? Oh, yes. Uh, we were able to write one another, so he knew the whole story. But he died there in Canada and was buried there, and I never saw him again. However, God gave me a new father, as it were, Joseph Manesty, who owned the ship that I had returned on, took me under his wing and treated me as if I were his own son. He got me a commission as first mate on a trade ship, and I did very well. Much of the rebellion in my spirit, the burning anger, had been washed away in Africa, and I no longer found myself always attracted to trouble. My new station in life secure, I could at long last go back to Kent and to my Polly, my beloved Polly. After years of remembering her face as in a dream, I was finally able to marry my dear Polly, the love of my life. According to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I give thee my troth. With this ring I will wear, with my body I be worship, and with all of my worldly goods I will be the Father and the Son. Before long, my benefactor Joseph Manesty promoted me to captain, captain of my own ship, the Duke of Argyle. The Duke of Argyle was a slaving ship, so my job as captain was to take the ship to the west coast of Africa 
very close to where I'd been held captive myself, pick up slaves there, transport them to the West Indies, there to exchange them for molasses and rum and return those to England. That's why we call it the triangular trade. Wait, you are a captain of a slave ship? After you were a slave yourself? How could you do that? You're a very astute young man. No, I was an infant in the faith and I really did not see the evils of the slave trade at the time. None of us did. It was considered an honorable way to make a living. But you were held captive. How could you do that to someone else? It was all too easy. You see, attitudes are starting to change now, but 20 years ago, no one questioned the slave trade, well, save the Quakers and a few Moravian missionaries in St. Thomas. Everyone in England that had any money at all had it invested in the slave trade. It was very profitable. And where profit is concerned, we turn a blind eye, don't we? All I could see at the time was that as a Christian ship captain, my job was to safely transport the slaves from one port to the other and treat them as well as possible, the same as I might do with a load of cattle. It wasn't uncommon on slave ships for almost a third of them to die on that middle passage. They were kept chained below decks, fed little food. I prided myself on the fact that only a few had ever died on my ships. I devised a routine of regular exercise for the slaves so that each day they would see the sunlight and keep themselves as fit and healthy as possible. I insisted with Mr. Manesty that we have sufficient provisions so that the slaves could maintain proper nourishment and not arrive starved. I did the same with the crew. I was proud that my ship had one of the best records for delivering slaves in good health. We only had a few deaths at sea. I felt each one personally and worked harder on each voyage to make sure that both crew and cargo stayed healthy and fit. It may not seem like much, but it was far more than most captains did in those days. I engaged the crew in regular times of worship. Ye shall have a song, as in the night when a holy solemnity is kept, and gladness of heart as when one goeth with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord to the mighty one of Israel. Let us pray. It was on this journey that I had the chance to return to the Banana Islands, to my own place of enslavement. I was even able to find one of the lime trees that I had planted with my own hands so many years before. Then came my third voyage in 1753 as captain of the African. We landed in Ghana to pick up a load of 600 slaves for transport to Jamaica.
It was on that voyage that I began to first wonder about the slave trade. last voyage. The weather looks good. We sail the day after tomorrow. I shall miss you terribly. I so wish you did not have to be gone so long. Yes, I know. But it is the nature of the trade. John? I'm afraid he suffered a stroke. I could no longer command a ship. How sad. It seemed very hard at the time, but we were later to understand that it was a blessing from God. A blessing? Yes, a blessing. You see, when God closes one way, it is often for a reason that we do not know or understand. Captain Potter, the man who took over the ship for me, and his entire crew were killed on that voyage. God, preserve us! Yes, he did preserve us. And it was a deep lesson, because what we thought was a curse at the time actually was filled with much grace. We moved back to Polly's family home in Kent for my recuperation. During this time, living in Kent, I had many hours of leisure, which I often spent outdoors. I had hours and hours for Bible study and for meditation. I spent many hours discovering the layers of grace present in our Lord's redeeming work. Slowly, I regained some of my strength, but I knew I would never again captain a ship. However, my knowledge of the business enabled me to obtain a position as Tide Surveyor of Liverpool, a position of great responsibility. Ahoy, Tidepool Surveyor, state your cargo. 100 barrels of rum and 100 barrels of molasses from the island. I worked for the customs office and was responsible to inspect incoming ships to make sure that proper import customs were paid to the government. Even with the remaining weakness from my stroke, I could still discharge the work with responsibility and yet have the free time to study the scriptures as I desired. Now that we were settled in a house in Liverpool, I made the most of my free time. I determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians. And I resolved to do nothing that would not serve that main purpose. I began to learn Greek, enough to allow me to understand the New Testament and the Septuagint. And then I began studying Hebrew the following year. I never attained a critical skill in any of these languages but I had no goal but to truly and faithfully understand the scriptural words and phrases so that I could judge for myself the meaning of any particular passage. Together with this, I kept up a course of reading the best writers of Christian theology I could find. Out of this gradually arose a new desire. My mother's hope when I was a child was that I should enter the ministry. Now, for the first time, I began to feel a strong calling in that direction myself. It was not a calling of which I felt worthy, but I felt in some ways I was the perfect person to proclaim the faithful saying from 1 Timothy, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save the chief of sinners. 
My life had been full of such remarkable turns, I seemed selected to show what the Lord could do. My initial enthusiasm was damped by refusal after refusal to consider me for ordination. I did not give up easily, but in rapid order I was turned down by the established church, by the dissenters, by the Methodists, and by the Presbyterians. Though not yet ordained, I began to preach at churches around Liverpool and to be well received. The Lord bestows many blessings upon his people, but unless he likewise gives them a thankful heart, they lose much of the comfort they might have in them. And this is not only a blessing in itself, but an earnest of more. King David, when he was peacefully settled in his kingdom, purposed to express his gratitude by building a place for the ark. I began to receive more and more invitations to preach or to speak about my life experiences. Polly, Polly, read this. You're to be the pastor of the parish church of St. Peter and St. Paul and only? Oh, John, it is an answer to our prayers. I had to wait over seven long years, but finally my dream to serve as a parish pastor would become true. And that, Samuel, is how I came to be the pastor of this parish. Of course, that was a number of years ago before you were born. It is quite a story. Yes, and let it be a lesson to you. For the story that God has in mind for you may be very different from what you have planned. The great adventure is finding God's will for your life. Oh, I did not know you had company. <laughs> yes, this is Samuel we met in the village. Ah, oh, aren't you Mrs. Watson's oldest? Aye, she's me stepmom. <laughs> Why don't you join us on Tuesday? John and I have begun a Bible school for the area children. Yes, you'll improve your reading skills and at the same time learn more about the Bible. If you're leading it, then I'll come. Oh, very good. Yes, <laughs> John, please remember that William Cowper is coming later to work on the poem. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cowper and I are working on some spiritual poems which can be sung to popular tunes like uh, uh, Black Eyed Susan or Mad Robin. I know of course you do. <laughs> you must be off now. Mr. Newton and Mr. Cowper have some very important work to do. Mr. Newton. Yes. Thanks for telling me the story. Well, thank you for listening, Samuel. And you'll be here on Tuesday. Aye. I'll be here on Tuesday. Very good. Very good. <laughs> John Newton Clark, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. He changed my life. A few years later, he was called the St. Mary Wall of the Church in London. When I was old enough, I joined him there. And through him, I met William Wilberforce, Join the movement to abolish the slave trade. It took years. 
the bill passed Parliament in 1807, the same year that Mr. Newton died. And the same year that you were born, Alexandria. But he lived to see the abolition of the slave trade. Oh, so he did it? Not he alone, but many working together. He did change the world. And he changed one life. The life of a little boy who was hurt and angry at the world. He taught me something of gentleness and of God's grace. And I hope you have a chance to learn of that grace as well.
Jesus Christ shed his blood to free his church. I demand that freedom. I demand that everyone leave those gloomy walls when our Lord of tyranny prevails. There was a body here once, an English philosopher. He's not here now. They couldn't leave him here. Not on sacred ground. Not after all he'd said. And done. And this I know. The truth will prevail. His name was John Wycliffe. He is called the Morning Star. It's the height of the Middle Ages, and the angel of death descends upon England. Black Death devastated Christendom, wiping out huge swathes of the population. Even the survivors suffered a massive psychological impact. Why had God chosen them to survive? Why had God sent the plague at all? What sin was he punishing? A wave of apocalypticism swept over Christianity, a conviction that the end times are at hand. People think that it's judgment from God for sinful lives. The world wasn't right, and God needed to send this message. Uh, and so it was a time of seeking, and a time of many uh, pre-established trends, patterns, social structures being thrown quite a bit up in the air, uh, and therefore a great time for academics to come in with new ideas. For one scholar, Newly arrived here in Oxford University, the horror of the plague was to cast a shadow over all his life. John Wycliffe probably came to Oxford as a 15-year-old, as many people entering Oxford would have been about 14 or 15. We think that he is from a village called Wycliffe in the North Riding of Yorkshire, so we think he's a northern guy. He probably came from the minor nobility, and from a family of some means that could support him. So he arrives in Oxford eager to make a name for himself and to do well. John Wycliffe was a student of remarkable ability, with a lifelong love of books and learning. He may have been brought up in Yorkshire, but Oxford soon became his home. Here, the great questions of life and death were grappled with, and Wycliffe threw himself into the scholarly debates with gusto. As he progressed from a student to a lecturer, Wycliffe began to find his voice. He soon earned himself a reputation as a formidable debater and astute philosopher, but it was his passion that made him popular among the students. Is it not then proved as utter foolishness to say that there is nothing more than the elements that if these fleshy eyes cannot see, if these hands of blood and bone cannot touch, it is not real. <laughs> and so we have proved our thesis. As the perfect defines the imperfect, so truth defines substance. And the corollary is obvious. Seek the truth. Nothing is more important than the truth. Seek it and find it. Wycliffe quickly became an established figure among the academics of Oxford. Here, at prestigious Balliol College, he was even briefly appointed as master. He was interested in philosophy, which of course was also theology, which was also politics. It was all joined up. 
He was the foremost philosopher theologian in Oxford, which at that time had eclipsed Paris as the foremost intellectual centre in Europe. The University of Wycliffe's day was little like it is today. For one thing, all the students and masters were, supposedly, celibate men. For another, they were inseparably intertwined with the church. There wasn't really any understanding of sacred and secular. The church was involved in everything, and the church was large. The church owned a third of Europe at the time. If you're a bishop, you are like a baron or an earl. A King would have seen his first role under God as a Christian ruler of a Christian people. Kings come and go, <laughs> but the church remains. The university is bound to the church, particularly in the theology faculty. They were all priests, of course, and they were in many cases high-level priests. Wycliffe had no hesitation in joining the church and becoming a priest. The salary was good, the opportunities were rich, and for an ambitious scholar, it was the natural next step. Not only was the church the biggest landowner in England and across Christendom, not only was it fabulously wealthy, not only did cardinals rival kings for sheer naked power, but the church held another trump card. Churchmen, whether monks or priests, were seen as super-Christians. They were treated with reverence by the ordinary people who marveled at their superior relationship with heaven. In Wycliffe's day, there was this general consensus God was the sovereign Lord of all. He had delegated dominion to the Pope. And if we want to reach heaven, we must live under the dominion of the papacy. Not being a Christian is not an option. It's a part of the society. You can't even think of yourself as non-Christian. A lot of that, though, was about culture, about external conformity rather than about personal faith. And so people would have seen their local parish priest as the gateway to God. Ordained as a priest, Wycliffe now embarked on a degree in theology, the queen of the sciences, the study of God. But from the beginning, he was a free thinker with a radical streak and dark memories carved on his mind. Wycliffe had seen that when the plague had swept over England, it had often hit the clergy hardest. Caring for the dying, giving the last rites, officiating at funerals, priests had often been at greater risk of infection than others. With no knowledge of modern medicine, Wycliffe had come to his own darker conclusions. The plague, he said, was a judgment on the church, and especially on the clergy, for their corruption and sin. They cared nothing for the spiritual needs of the people, but only for cultural and political domination. In some ways, it's really easy to point out the decadence, the potential corruption. You know, they come around asking for taxes, you have to give money to these friars all the time who are just begging for the money, like, go get a job. And some of the fiercest critics of this kind of corruption, if you will, were churchmen themselves. The church was giving no pastoral care. It was far too involved in politics. It didn't have the ordinary believer's salvation at its core. Soon, sad news reached Wycliffe from his northern hometown. His parents were dead. It is said they are buried right here in the floor of the parish church. Wycliffe was now Lord of the Manor. It
It was a minor role in feudal England, responsible for a few farms and a huddle of houses. But it brought Wycliffe to the attention of his overlord, John of Gaunt. A son of the aging king, John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, was one of the richest and most powerful men in England. He was also one of the most divisive. So, another village in the hands of the church. Oh my lord. Oh, this is spare my me your legal quibbles. Wherever I turn, England is in the hands of bishops, priests, and monks, and their greed knows no bounds. My lord, I agree. In the words of our lord, non potestus Deus avere et money, one cannot serve God and money. The plague made it clear to me. The church has lost its way. <laughs> you are an unusual priest. Well, it's no use carping on the sidelines. You two are part of the church. If your church is lost, as you say it is, then it will need someone to set it back on the right road. Either you fix the problem, John of Wycliffe, or you are the problem. My lord, I'm only a philosopher. <laughs> Go philosophize then. England needs more than philosophers. Others may scoff, but for Wycliffe, philosophy was foundational in understanding the world. Back here in Oxford, he poured himself into his work, writing papers on logic and metaphysics. Even in these abstract works, Wycliffe's biting intellect is revealed in his rigorous analysis of difficult questions. The deepest, toughest issue of the age was the nature of reality. Here is an object, an apple. Here is another apple. These are totally separate, completely different objects, yet we naturally see them together, apples. For centuries, philosophers had followed Plato and Aristotle in saying that these two objects are linked because they both share certain qualities, universals. God had not only created green things, he had created the color green. He had not only created round things, he had created the circle. He had not only created individual apples, he created the concept of appleness that all apples share. Above the material realm, directly projected from the mind of God, was the universal green, the universal circle, or the universal apple, from which all other apples gain their appleness. Wycliffe was a realist philosopher. He was convinced that these universals really existed. Everything he believed and taught was built on this foundation. Universals, in his view, were more real than the actual objects that we see or touch or taste. For Wycliffe, all of these real universals are ultimately a cosmic order or a cosmic glue which connected the whole of creation back to the creator in this great chain of being. All things are connected in a golden chain from God and God's mind down to the smallest dust particle, the tiniest living creature, the tiniest dead thing. All of this, when it exists, what it does as it exists, when it ceases to exist. You mean that God has an idea of a frog in the Amazon that is three inches higher in the tree than the other frog? Absolutely. God understands absolutely everything. As it happens, that it's happening, and God wills that it happens that way. This is a radically different approach to philosophical reasoning than was common at the time of Wycliffe. 20 years after he arrived in Oxford, Wycliffe was appointed Doctor of Theology, one of the foremost scholars in England. He had earned the right to speak, and his voice began to be heard beyond the walls of the university.
Academic wranglings were considered harmless enough, until Wycliffe began to investigate one particularly sensitive universal. Power. What was it that gave one person the right to rule over others? Did bishops and barons have the right to oppress and exploit the peasants? My lord. What made the king and his army different from a gang of thugs? In his two books, Civil Dominion and Divine Dominion, Wycliffe laid out his argument point by point. The conclusions to which he came were revolutionary. Be he bishop or beggar, all men are but stewards, and a faithless steward may be justly stripped of all he thinks he owns. Wycliffe began with God's authority over creation. For him, this was the universal dominion that made possible all other power relationships in the universe. If such power was to be legitimate, it had to follow the pattern established by God. In the Garden of Eden, at the beginning of time, there had been no private property. There had been no kings or slaves. Adam and Eve had lived as equals and held all things in common. Wycliffe saw the whole civil structure, the king, the lords, law and order, as a temporary fix ordained by God because of sin. But the church was called to champion a higher path. The church should pattern itself on the original perfection of the Garden of Eden. It should not have political power. It should not have private property. If you look at the model of the early Christian church, there's no property, there's no wealth. The calling of the church in the world was not to accumulate wealth and prestige and power. And Wycliffe demanded that all Christians, especially the pastors in the church, must eliminate private property, all of it. It's not an option. The king must divest the church of all of its private property. My lord finds your books make stimulating reading. You've gained his favor. I did not write merely on his account. I don't remember the year of the plague, when each morning you woke up wondering who would be dead by evening, wondering if it would be you. And who knows how much time any of us have left. No, I must devote my energies now as much to practical matters as to theoretical. Indeed, well, Master Wycliffe, my lord has a practical matter for you. You will join the royal delegation and come with us to Bruges. Wycliffe's writings had come at the perfect time, and here, in the city of Bruges, in modern Belgium, his career was about to take off. The Pope had written to the King of England, insisting that he was the true landowner and was only renting England to the King. The English, he said, had paid neither tax nor rent in the last 30 years and now owed a colossal sum of back payments to the Vatican. Naturally, the English were none too keen on this idea and sent a delegation to negotiate with the Pope's agents. With his radical ideas on wealth and power, Wycliffe was hired as one of their key advocates. Wycliffe was delighted to be asked to take on such a prominent job. These were the moments that could change a man's life and see him propelled upwards to the precipitous pinnacles of power. To whom does England belong? To the king? To the pope? To the people? No. It belongs to Jesus Christ. And why then does the Pope levy taxes? For the glory of Christ? 
No. It's to wage his sordid war. The Pope behaves not as the Vicar of Christ, but as a common cut purse. In Wycliffe's view, the church had decayed. These papal agents, these bishops in their palaces, it looks wrong to him. The church needed to recover its calling, what he would call its apostolic roots. Wycliffe's arguments won him the friendship of John of Gaunt and the other lords, but he also made some fierce enemies. With the negotiations over, Wycliffe returned home to Oxford. He was confident it wouldn't be long before he saw the rewards of his work. He waited and waited. Finally, the bitter truth began to dawn. No reward was coming. Other delegates had been promoted. Some had been made bishops, but Wycliffe had not climbed a single rung. I do think Wycliffe felt bitter about his lack of preferment and becomes a bit disillusioned, I think, after that. Often when someone is rejected and, and their views dismissed, they actually are radicalized. He's sort of more free to express himself in the way that he wants to. His rate of publication goes up. He gathers a number of disciples around him. And he becomes more antagonistic towards even the most high powers. What does our Lord say? Blessed are the poor in spirit. What do they say? Blessed are the rich and powerful. What does our Lord say? Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. What do they say? Blessed are the fat who eat their fill of fine food every day and lift not one finger to produce it. Who would you rather follow? Our leaders in the church or the Lord Jesus Christ? But Wycliffe's problems were only beginning. The church had worked hard to gain political power. Now they had it, and they were able to use it. William Courtney, Bishop of London, had once been a colleague of Wycliffe's at Oxford University. Now he demanded Wycliffe appear before a disciplinary inquiry. But Wycliffe was not just an unruly priest who needed to be brought to heel. In a twist of irony, his idealistic campaign against wealth and power had landed him some wealthy, powerful friends, nobles who hungered lustily for the riches of the church. To them, Wycliffe turned for help. When the date of his trial came, John of Gaunt came too. It's a very serious charge. It's not a serious charge when it comes from stupid men. If I had known, sir, that you hoped to intimidate this sacred court, I would have prevented your entry. I do as I please, where I please. Then do as you please, my lord. The hearing is now in session. Come, sir, sit down and rest. He must not sit. The accused shall stand before his judge. I see no judge. All I see is a stupid, snivelling priest. Do you think your priestly robes can protect you from a sword blade? Do me whatever harm you can, my lord. My protection is in God most high. I will drag this fool out by his hair. No. My lord! I will drag him out by his hair, I swear! Your Grace, we must work. <laughs> it had seemed such a good idea at the time. Fight politics with politics. 
Wycliffe had hoped that with such a show of strength, he could look his opponents in the eye. But it all backfired. The hearing broke up in chaos and riots erupted all over London. Houses were broken into and one man was even killed. Do not lay this upon my head. How was I to know? How was I to know? John of Gaunt's very active in trying to gain power and wrest that power away from the church. He had a gift for making enemies. He was a constant enemy of the Bishop of London. And it was a feather in John's cap to have this brilliant churchman making his arguments for him. Many people would have seen it as a kind of partnership of convenience. And arguably, I think it probably was. Wycliffe managed to escape, getting back to Oxford. But they said he had been saved by the devil. After the debacle in London, any explanation Wycliffe might offer would fall on deaf ears. Many church leaders now saw him as no better than the greedy barons he allied with, a naive pawn being used to undermine the whole English church. Rather than achieving victory in London, Wycliffe had only made the church angry, and they had ways of exacting their revenge. What is this? John Wycliffe, you are under arrest. Unhand me, sir! Letters had arrived in England addressed to the King, the Archbishop and the University. Letters from the Pope. Letters demanding the immediate arrest and imprisonment of John Wycliffe on the charge of heresy. Heresy. The very word was enough to make the blood run cold. A heretic was excommunicated from the church, made a non-person. Their soul was to be damned to hell for all eternity. Today, we tend to think of heresy as something that shows independence and intellectual capacity. And uh, I don't mind being considered a heretic. Well, I assure you, in the 14th century, being considered a heretic meant that you were not going to heaven. It was as dangerous to the welfare of individual Christians as Black Death was to the health of individual Christians. Physical disease is bad enough. You know, your body will die, but that is nothing compared to the gravity of being tormented in hell and losing your soul for eternity. Locked in a cell in Oxford, awaiting word of his trial, Wycliffe was able to do nothing more than pray and think. Heretics denied that Jesus was God or claimed that there was no such thing as sin. In comparison to these, what had Wycliffe said? That the Pope had too much political power? That the church should live in poverty? That righteous kings could challenge corrupt bishops? Were these ideas really heresy? William Courtney thought so. The Bishop of London had not forgotten the insults he had received, and was determined that this time, Wycliffe would get everything that was coming to him. He detests authority and claims that the church should be ripped apart and handed to the peasants coin by coin. I'll leave the cheap oratory to the friars. Wycliffe is in prison, what harm can he do? Sit down, try the wine. Please tell me you do not intend to ignore the greatest threat the devil has raised in England these last hundred years. Tell me! Do not presume to lecture me, Courtney. I am both Archbishop and Chancellor. I eclipse you in the sight of God and of man. Your Grace, if you neglect your holy office in this hour, your name will be forever cursed.
You will have your trial. Will that not suffice? This is not the time for laxity, Your Grace. You have but one choice. Wycliffe must burn. Lambeth Palace, the citadel of the English church. Here, Wycliffe was summoned to give account. The stakes couldn't be higher. He was no longer facing a mere inquiry. He was in a fight for his life. I am ready. Ready to defend my own conclusions. Even unto death. All rise. Proceed. All rise. Just as the trial was starting, orders came from the Queen. On no account was the court to proceed to sentence. Wycliffe's political friends had come to his rescue once again. Wycliffe couldn't be sentenced but the court forbade him ever again to criticize the wealth of the church. He was free, but the experience was a watershed moment. If Wycliffe could be accused of heresy over what was essentially a political issue, how could anyone trust the church with spiritual issues? In the years following Wycliffe's trial, he starts to look at aspects of the church which he hadn't considered before. Sometimes the simpler laity were being taken advantage of, often for monetary gain. People were being given false hope of forgiveness in return for money. And he was violently opposed to it because it actually distanced people from God and uh, reinforced superstitions. Priests, bishops, and even the Pope were getting increasingly wealthy based on the naive and mistaken hopes of the people. The church hierarchy had destroyed his career and sought his death. Now, fueled by frustration and resentment, feeling he had little left to lose, Wycliffe saw himself at war with the corrupted church and was ready to fight with everything he had. Wycliffe's prime target quickly became the friars, wandering preachers that he marked down as hypocrites. They take vows of poverty and live in luxury. They call themselves preachers, but only entertain with rhymes and fables. They follow not the law of Christ, but the rules of their founders, of St. Francis or Dominic. They obey men rather than God, and think themselves most pleasing in the sight of heaven. Oh, pity them, these benighted men, who do not know the depths of their own darkness. Wycliffe now began a series of books targeting these corrupt clerics. Idleness and Begging, The Poverty of Christ, Against the Begging Friars. These were written not in Latin, but in English. They were not just designed for scholars, but for everyone in England. The friars, wrote Wycliffe, were seducing the souls of those who put their trust in them and bringing them to spiritual ruin. Grace, the great law of Christ, was being buried under their endless little rules and regulations. The medieval church had rules and regulations that on the surface used the words of the Bible, but were devoid 
of the contextual grace of the Bible. Whereas Wycliffe said, we are saved by God's grace, by his favour and kindness to us. And if you have received God's grace, if you are in a state of grace, you will therefore live differently. Wycliffe understood that the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't simply a, a code that we are called to follow. You have to live the Christ-centered life. It's a life of forgiveness. It's a life of deep engagement with the individual relationship to God. Trust fully in Christ. Rely altogether on his sufferings. Beware of seeking to be justified in any other way than by his righteousness. Beware of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy was not only to be found in the church. There were plenty two-faced rogues in England, and Wycliffe would soon find himself defending the indefensible. Robert Hawley and John Shackle were two soldiers imprisoned in the Tower of London until they paid their debts. Resourceful and determined, these two men escaped the tower, avoided the guard, and fled for sanctuary here to Westminster Abbey. For centuries, church buildings had provided a refuge for people fleeing from tyranny. But John of Gaunt cared nothing for these old traditions. He ordered his men to enter the abbey and take the escaped prisoners dead or alive. The church was furious. This flagrant disregard for the sacred was blasphemy itself. The archbishop excommunicated the soldiers involved, and when Parliament next met, he demanded that John of Gaunt be held responsible. The matter went to court, and Gaunt hired Wycliffe to speak on his behalf. Perhaps he imagined that Wycliffe, chastened after his trial, might speak with diplomacy and balance. He was quite wrong. Trained in the cut and thrust of intellectual debate, Wycliffe tore into the church. Was it not shameful for them to harbour criminals in their walls under the pretext of some imagined sanctuary? Were they not turning the house of God into the proverbial den of thieves? Nothing is good enough in the Duke was mortified. Morally and legally, he was on the back foot, and the last thing he needed was Wycliffe throwing intellectual grenades around Parliament. Backtracking furiously, forced into concessions left and right, he would never trust or protect Wycliffe again. Despite the loss of his patron, Wycliffe was determined to keep going, to show the world the corruption, hypocrisy and perversion of the church. But then, something happened on the continent to confirm all his worst ideas. Two rival popes emerged, and Christendom split down the middle. As the conflict between these two popes escalated into all-out war, it became clear that something had gone very wrong in the church. The problem was that the same College of Cardinals had elected two different men. Neither of them are morally upstanding human beings. I'm, I'm sorry, if, if that makes people upset. Look, one of the popes, Robert of Geneva, his job before he became Clement VII, he was a mercenary who had massacred entire towns. This is not a good man. Wycliffe, like many others, saw the schism as yet a further blow to the authority of the papacy as an institution. So Wycliffe was by no means original in his criticism of the papacy, but he certainly was 
scripturally grounded in a way that many other papal critics were not. Meanwhile, here in Oxford, Wycliffe was getting down to some serious study. Despite his anger at the church, he wasn't interested in merely flinging dirt. There were plenty of rogues happy to do that. Wycliffe wanted to understand where the church had gone wrong, and how to put it right. Perhaps the most obvious place to start was at the top, with the two rival popes. Both men call the other a usurper. Both men call the other an antichrist. Could not both men be right? Could not two popes equal one antichrist? Jesus Christ was God made man. The Pope, said Wycliffe, was man behaving as God. In his book, The Power of the Pope, Wycliffe was clear. Antichrist ruled the church. It might seem a lurid idea, but Wycliffe saw the Pope as the focal point of a much wider problem. The church had rejected spiritual power in favor of political domination. But was there another way to think about the whole notion of church? The church is the spouse of Christ. She is the mother of everyone who shall be saved and contains no one else. Outside the church, there can be no salvation. This was a basic idea of the Christian faith. But what exactly was the church? Wycliffe's next book, The Church, tackled the question head on. If the medieval notion of church was false, Wycliffe wanted to find out where the true church could be seen. A typical medieval person would have defined the church in terms of clerics. All of the priests, friars, monks, bishops, all the visible church, the church that you go along to on a Sunday or the, the monastery up the road. It's the identification of the church as a human institution. No, the church is not a human institution. It is not buildings. It is not social rank. It is not wealth. It is the living body of Christ here on earth. When Wycliffe thinks of the church, he thinks of all the people who are eventually going to be in heaven. He thinks of people who are in a state of grace. We might potentially now use the, the phrase, are you in a relationship or are you walking with Jesus? And that overhauls really the whole medieval view of the church and what it means to be one of God's people. But Wycliffe's investigation was not over. If the church was not founded on the clergy, the Pope and the traditions of the centuries, then where? The answer, when he came to it, was obvious. The Bible was, of course, the central document of the church, but it was treated quite differently than it is today. It was seen as an advanced textbook to be reverentially studied by clerics and students of theology, not casually read by just anyone. There was a real fear that the Bible could be misinterpreted during Wycliffe's day. The uneducated reader could be led into error and even heresy and thus the loss of his or her immortal soul. Why would you give the revelation from God to someone who couldn't read or didn't understand the true meaning and the different senses behind the Bible? Uh, it was considered a dangerous thing to do. And so whilst people would have had many ideas that were Christian, they would have been very muddled up with superstition, um, with old wives' tales, with anything else that was going on. I know they are only peasants, but you expect them to know something. I was preaching from the simplest stories of the Bible, but for all they knew, it could have been Plato. But where would the people learn these stories? From the friars? Pictures on the wall of churches. Old wives' tales at bedtime. 
How will they know what the Bible really says if they never have the opportunity to discover for themselves? So what's the answer? What do we do? This was Wycliffe's response to the problem, the truth of sacred scripture. The church, he said, and indeed the whole Christian faith, could only be founded on the word of God, on the Bible. For John Wycliffe, the Bible stands above every authority. And if it's not in the Bible, then the church needs to radically reshape its life in the light of Holy Scripture. In 32 detailed chapters, Wycliffe methodically works to his conclusions. The Bible is superior to all human thought. It is from God. It is true. It is the foundation for all society. And most especially, all Christians have a right and duty to read it. Medieval people were exposed to the Bible in various forms. Many of them knew biblical stories. Parish churches would be painted with biblical motifs. But the Bible wasn't really their avenue towards a deeper relationship with God. Wycliffe said, our salvation is found in the Christ of the Bible. And it's the Jesus of the Bible we need to get back to. Any one of these three books would have been controversial. Taken together, they represented a radically new approach to religion, and the name of John Wycliffe began to be heard across England. The church leaders fumed at the newfound fame of their adversary, until exciting news reached their ears. Wycliffe had suddenly fallen ill and was now close to death. Surely this was the hand of God at work. All the church needed to do now was convince Wycliffe to back down. You still have time. Repent, recant, and be received back into the arms of Holy Mother Church. Please, help me out. I shall not die, but live. And once again I shall declare the evil deeds of you false friars and crooked clerics. <laughs> it was not yet Wycliffe's time to die. His greatest task still lay before him, for which he would need all his strength. Wycliffe knew that as one man there was a limit to what he could do. But as a teacher of students, he could equip and inspire others to carry his gospel out of Oxford and into all England. Do not forget, the highest service that man may attain to on earth is to preach the word of God. The church has failed us. They care not for our souls and spirits, but for coin and comfort. Do the priests comfort the sick? Do the friars preach the love of Christ? No. No. They go from the sermon to the alehouse, from the altar to the gaming table. You want to know what I think? Forget the church. Come to Christ. Bursting out of Oxford into the villages, the farms, and the market towns, Wycliffe students began to preach. These poor preachers, as they became known, were consciously attempting to get back to the earliest days of the church, when, they said, Christianity was pure and simple. The first generation of Christians were not bishops or clerics, but ordinary men and women fired up with a compelling message. Jesus Christ has risen. Death is defeated. In Jesus Christ there is life 
everlasting. And this life is held out to you today. My poor preachers, with this said, are like the apostles. They go out into the world and they spread the good news of Christ. And they don't do it by claiming Wycliffe authority. They do it by claiming scripture authority. They would have been preaching, if you will, a reform message. But the emphasis would have been on the reform beginning in one's own soul. The essence of Wycliffe's gospel was that there is um, a sacrifice of atonement that makes sinners right with God. But it's not made at the mass, and it's not made in purgatory. It was made by the one who is both God and man. People need to trust in Christ. It's not so hard to imagine that some people would have found this um, reasonable, sensible, and maybe even lit a fire under some of them. The idea of unauthorized men freely preaching was thrilling for some, but the church had not survived for 12 centuries by letting impostors claim to speak for Christ. Bishop Courtney certainly was not going to sit back and watch Wycliffe's men wander the countryside undermining his church at every turn, preaching who knew what nonsense. He pushed through a law that any unlicensed preacher was to be arrested and locked up. Courtney and the others had hope that Wycliffe's poor preacher movement would dry up, but it was stubbornly holding on. The preachers had shown their love and care for the people, and now the people were cheerfully paying them back in kind. I was told it was urgent, Your Grace. Alarming reports were coming back to the authorities. Walls of people surrounding the preachers. Officers repelled at sword point. And always the preachers reaching further into England. It's not enough. For everyone we lock away, another springs up. Hell is let loose upon England. Courtney. You are going to ruin another perfectly lovely afternoon. Now, before you burst a blood vessel, let me introduce you to someone. William Burton, the new chancellor at Oxford, a stickler for orthodoxy and a loyal friend of the church. A useful ally, I'm sure you agree. Hmm. For all your orthodoxy, your school has become a hotbed of heresy. Tell me, sir, how do you intend to prove your loyalty? I'll tell you what I won't do. I'm not going to let Wycliffe bring down trouble on our heads. He's already been shown too much leniency. Opposition from the church was to be expected. Opposition closer to home hurt more. The new chancellor formed a committee of top scholars to investigate Wycliffe in-house. What they uncovered was truly shocking. The medieval church believed that at the moment the priest said the words of consecration, the bread and wine of the mass were transformed into the literal body and blood of Jesus. It was the central ritual of Christianity, but Wycliffe, said it was all wrong. The Eucharist is the lifeblood of the medieval church. This could affect people's lives, people's salvation. Theologians had spent lifetimes reasoning about transubstantiation. I have collected arguments for transubstantiation, and I regard the collection as like a collection of butterflies. Each individual one is unique, and odd and remarkable in its way, um, <laughs> and they don't fly anymore. <laughs> For John Wycliffe, his problems with transubstantiation are at two levels. Number one, and most significantly, he doesn't find it in the Bible. 
you look in vain to find that doctrine in the Bible, but also philosophically. He said, no, that, that is just nonsense. That is, is inflicting such illogic upon the logic of Christ. And Wycliffe believed, therefore, that the bread remained substantially, and yet it underwent a kind of spiritual transformation into Christ's body. So if you had asked Wycliffe, is Christ's body really present? He would have said, yes, it is spiritually present. The bread and the wine remain bread and wine, but we must receive it by faith. This was Wycliffe's most controversial idea yet. The Mass wasn't an abstract idea. It was the holiest mystery of religion that every medieval Christian loved dearly. Wycliffe's last political support melted away, and the newly hostile university took action. By the authority of the Chancellor, all those who teach or hear the following doctrines will be subject to imprisonment. Furthermore, They hadn't used his name on their proclamation. They didn't have to. Everybody knew who was meant. After more than 30 years in Oxford, Wycliffe had to leave. It was here Wycliffe came to minister as the parish priest in Lutterworth, a little east of what is now the city of Birmingham. Angry and resentful, he found himself banished from his home, his friends, and his place of work. If his life had become a war against the church, he had decidedly lost. There were certainly those in his circle whose anger drove them on to ever bloodier aggression. A revolution in Jesus' name. Have you listened to nothing I have taught? Of course I have listened. All the predestined are at once kings and priests. Your words, sir. Well, if we are priests, what need have we for the clerics? If we are kings, what need have we of King Richard? That is treason, and not my meaning. God did not create human beings to simply be oppressed and exploited by kings and popes. When Adam delved and Eve span, where was then the gentleman? John. Human beings were not created to be peasants or soldiers or kings. We were created to be Christians and to follow the law of Christ. All across England, our people, Christian people, are standing up and saying enough. Enough tyranny, enough fear. Will you not join us? All my life, England has known the way of fear. Show them the better way. Love your enemies. We won't forget you, Doctor. It was you who showed us the way. The church authorities hated Wycliffe, but there were those who hated the authorities even more. In the height of summer, inspired by the radical preaching of John Ball, the peasants marched on London. The time has come, as God ordained. Cast off our yoke of bondage! Demanding an end to oppressive taxation, they stormed the capital and took control. Powerful men and wealthy women fled for shelter to the Tower of London but they found no safety there. The rebels breached the gates and hunted down their old oppressors one by one. There he is. I see him. Yeah. Hello, Your Grace. Hello there. Yeah. 
The head of the Archbishop of Canterbury with other abusive noblemen was paraded round the town and impaled on a spike here on Tower Bridge. The revolt could not last. The king regained authority quickly and order was brutally restored. But everything had changed. Across all England, there was a backlash against any talk of reform, and the new Archbishop of Canterbury saw his chance. Wycliffe's preachers had been speaking to the peasants. The peasants had listened. And then the peasants had revolted. <sighs> yes, yes, it must have been him. <laughs> I did not hear you, villain. Was he the inspiration for your rebellion? <laughs> yes. Yes, it was he. John Wycliffe. An open letter was circulated, naming Wycliffe as the true author of the revolt. It was an unlikely charge. In truth, Wycliffe hated violence and had even preached against such normal ideas as war and capital punishment. But the allegations alone were enough. Among the nobility, Wycliffe was now a scandal and disgrace. Free to make his move, Archbishop Courtney assembled a synod here in Blackfriars, London to try Wycliffe once again for heresy. Wycliffe's errors were truly fundamental this time, and Courtney was sure he could get a conviction. The Eucharist heads the list, but there are other uh, propositions on that list as well. Wycliffe challenges a number of normal practices in most churches, particularly around icons. He was quite firmly and at times violently against anything that seemed to come in between um, God and people. He also attacked the idea of tithes, which he thought shouldn't go to corrupt clerics. So Wycliffe thought that uh, any man could be holy as long as he lived a life of faith. These are really radical ideas, and they have the potential to upend not just the church, but of course society. For some days, the synod sat in judgment. But just as they were coming to the point of pronouncing the verdict, London was shaken by a rare earthquake. This is God's voice! We are rebuked! Your grace, we must adjourn! Brothers, hold! This is indeed a rebuke from God, yes. For allowing Wycliffe's heresy to be tolerated in England. See, now the earth is now at peace. So too will the convulsions of our mother church be stilled, when heresy is driven out of England. Archbishop Courtney had his way. Wycliffe was convicted of heresy 10 times over, and anyone found to be teaching his ideas was to be imprisoned. Courtney now came to Oxford with a caravan of clerics. He ordered the masters of the university to summon Wycliffe to stand before them and answer for his wickedness. Since Jesus Christ shed his blood to free his church, I demand that freedom. You demand? See, the devilish pride at the heart of heresy. 
See and beware. I do demand. I demand that the poor inhabitants of our towns and villages be not constrained to fill the purses of ungodly priests. I demand that everyone leave those gloomy walls where a law of tyranny prevails and embrace a simple and peaceful life under the open vault of heaven. Bravo. Now hear what the Pope demands. That John Wycliffe, heretic, shall stand before the papal court. Though there should be one hundred popes, and all the friars alive be transformed to cardinals, still I would not trust them unless they stand on holy scripture. As judged according to your own heresies? The Bible is not for your private interpretation, much less of unschooled farm boys. God appointed us, his church, to teach his word with divine authority. Your grace, the Bible is its own authority. It is for the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. I will obey God rather than men. All the doctors of the church have had one voice, and you alone defy them! You think you contend with me alone, an old man on the brink of the grave? No. You contend with truth itself. And this I know. The truth will prevail. Wycliffe, stay where you are. Distracted with the struggle for the papal throne, Courtney and the others had no time to pursue Wycliffe further. He was left alone here in Lutterworth. His old age, however, was neither peaceful nor tranquil, and he had to watch as Oxford was purged of his ideas and his followers. Rejected by the university and the church, he might well have despaired wallowing in fury at the injustice of the system. But somewhere along the way, Wycliffe's indignation and outrage had given way to a much deeper motivation. It had begun as a furious campaign to expose a corrupted religion. Now, despite his hardship, Wycliffe had a yearning to share the great spiritual truths he had discovered with the people around him. Here, in the quiet backwater of a Midlands parish, Wycliffe began a greater work, a work which could never be fueled by mere anger. Englishmen learn God's law best in English. Moses heard God's law in his own language, as did Christ's apostles. And so shall it be for us. It was an idea Wycliffe had been toying with for some time. All physical Bibles are directly connected to the universal Bible, the Word of God. But according to the Bible, the Word of God was Jesus Christ himself, the Logos, the revelation of God's truth to humanity. All actual Bibles were therefore directly connected with Jesus. They were projections of his truth and revelation into the material world. The language of the text mattered no more than the shape of the paper. What did matter was that people were able to read, hear, and understand the Bible for themselves. 
And so was born this, the Wycliffe Bible. The Bible for Wycliffe is a different kind of thing in creation. Scripture comes from the mouth of God. So if you want everybody to be saved, they need to hear God speak. So the best thing you can do is give people the Bible. And so putting it into the English language was absolutely central so that people could know what they were saying. The task of translating the Bible was far too much for one aging man, no matter how brilliant. But Wycliffe was not alone. His teaching had impacted many scholars and a team quickly assembled, inspired and motivated by his vision. It's difficult to say how much of the Bible Wycliffe was directly involved in translating or how much was completed during his lifetime. But it is certain that on its arrival, the English Bible caused a sensation. These were the days before the printing press, and Wycliffe's full handwritten Bible would be phenomenally expensive, not to mention rather heavy. Nevertheless, there was huge interest. From the greatest to the least, the people treasured whatever portion of the Bible they could get. We see now by a mirror in darkness, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know as I am known. And now dwelleth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the most of these is charity. For many years, the people had lived in religious terror. They knew they were sinners and God's fearsome judgment awaited them after death. When the plague had struck, some had even punished themselves in the hopes of persuading God that they had suffered enough. The approach of Wycliffe and his disciples was quite different. God was not a furious tyrant to be placated, but a gracious father who had rescued his children from the hands of the devil and now called them to walk with him in faith, hope and love. Despite all the authorities could do, Wycliffe's message won a wide and eager following in England, spreading a culture of Bible study and spiritual Christianity for the next 150 years. That is what animates John Wycliffe. He seeks to recover for the church and for the world the significance of the written Word of God. How does God want his people to live? We don't need to devise it or divine it. We need to go to the Scriptures to find out, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before their God. Just after Christmas, 1384, while conducting Mass here in his church in Lutterworth, John Wycliffe had a stroke. A few days later, he peacefully died. In this thing is the perfect love of God with us. And we have trust in the day of doom. For as he is, also we be in this world. Dread is not in love, but perfect love putteth out dread. Therefore, love we God, for he loved us before. It can be difficult to separate the real Wycliffe from the myth. He has been painted as both a heretic and a saint, a hero and a villain. But as always, the truth runs deeper. I think the name Morning Star is kind of perfect because Morning Star is not full light, right? Wycliffe's soteriology, his theory of salvation, would have been thoroughly medieval. I don't think he neatly fits into a sort of a label like Catholic or Protestant. He's really simply a Bible man. And that, I think, is the fitting epitaph for his life. I do admire 
his commitment to truth, an absolute determined commitment to truth. Reformers look back, they see his place in history as monumental because they say that he appeared in the darkest days of the church. And the fact that God would send someone, would send the Holy Spirit, is proof that God never left. Now I'm the vicar of the church where uh, John Wycliffe was in Lutterworth, and he's remembered here, but the real legacy that he leaves isn't some old books, but is in fact a, a, a living, breathing heart of people living out their faith. In 1428, over 40 years later, the church dug up Wycliffe's bones and, with great ceremony, burned them for heresy. The ashes were thrown in the nearby river, and the river carried them down to the sea, where the ocean tides washed them around the globe from shore to shore. And today, Wycliffe's teachings are shared and believed in every country of the world. Take good care of him. 
Once I get him working in the field, he'll be in good shape. I know you will. It just doesn't make it any easier to see him leave home. You still have that show pony? I do. Well, if you need any help with him, you let me know. I'll send James over when I can, and he'll keep an eye on him. He's not doing too good. Had the vet out again, he's kind of colicky, hasn't been eaten. I don't know what else to do. It's a shame. I know how you love these horses. Yeah, well, you take good care of them for me, okay? Will do. I understand. Yes. Monday? Okay, that sounds great. All right, we'll see you then. Okay, thanks. Bye. Lizzie, if you need us, all you have to do is call. Lizzie. Lizzie. Your mother was talking to you. Lizzie, this visit is going to be good for you. Whatever. You're still abandoning me. That's not true. No. No. You'll get some fresh air, clear your head, spend time with Grandma and the horses. Okay. Lizzie, if we could stay with you, we would, but we have to work. Yeah. You know, it really sucks being kicked out of your own house for Christmas. I know, sweetie. I know, but you'll be all right. See this face? Do I recognize it? Yeah, thanks, Mom. It's hard getting out of the city. I know. So, how are you? You look lovely. Oh, thank you. How's business? It's good. Yeah. Busy. Busy's good. Mm -hmm. So, where's my granddaughter? She won't get out of the car until we leave. Really? Mm hmm. Um, you have no idea. It's been rough. Hey, why don't you come out and say hi to your grandma? Hi. See what I mean? Uh, well, strong-willed, moody. I wonder where she gets it from. <laughs> it's called being a teenager. She'll be fine. Well, I hope this time away will be good for her. I'm sure it will. And it'll be nice to have somebody here living with me, too. So can I get you a cup of coffee, fix you a snack before you hit the road? Oh, we have contracts. We have to get in first thing in the morning. It's a really long drive. We wish we could, though. Yeah, I understand. We'll see you okay. later. Oh, good to see you. So good to see you. If she gives you any trouble, let me know. I'll come pick her up if I have to. I'm sure she's going to be just fine. Now, you guys drive safe. <laughs> Miss you. Bye. You want something to eat? No. Something to drink? How about we go for a hike? I hate nature. I'm just gonna go to my room. You want help unpacking? I'm fine. Your bags are in your room. This is a horrible picture of me. I love this picture of you. That's stupid. Okay, let's go for a walk. Now.
Didn't you guys used to have a lot of horses here? Yeah, me and your grandpa used to have seven. Do you miss him? What, your grandfather? Yeah, of course I do. What do you remember about him? He'd give me a dollar every time I'd visit. Figures. Why don't we go take a look at my pony? Where are they? Keep going. She's so cute. Something wrong with her? He's very sick. He's got colic and well, I had the vet out to look at him, but he hasn't been eating anything at all and I don't know what else to do with him. I don't have the time to sit here and just be with him all day. I've tried everything I know. What about the rest of them? I, um, I couldn't take care of him anymore. So you just gave them away? No, Lizzie, it's not as easy as that. It's not important right Not now. important. I know exactly how they felt. Nobody wants me either. You are wanted. And you're very much loved. What's this one's name? You know, he doesn't have a bar name yet. I couldn't come up with a name that I thought would fit, so... I thought that you might want to name him. Seriously? Yeah, but you have to take care of him. That's the deal. If you name him, you take care of him. I don't know anything about taking care of a horse. Raising horses is in your blood. It's gonna come to you. I've never done it before. Well, he is very sick. And he needs a friend right now. And frankly, I think that you could use one too. What do you say? Hmm? I don't know. A horse has to really, really trust you. And um, you can't force it. And for some reason, this is my last one. And I have not been able to contact with him. So I just want you to try. What do you say? You got a deal? Hmm? Okay. Deal. Brought you some fresh towels. Thanks. Your mom got me that. Do you know that? Cool. Yeah, I love the snow. I wish it snowed more here. What about you? If you could do anything you wanted, no restrictions, what do you want to do with your life? I don't know. I guess. I guess I'd want to be somebody important and do something good. Like helping people? I guess. I just don't want to be obsessed with my job like my parents are. Hmm. Yeah, it's whatever. Okay, well, I'll leave you be now. If you get bored, you want to read a book? Your grandfather's got some down the hall. He used to read everything. How about grilled cheese sandwich and some tomato soup? Sure. Okay.
Well, now what's beating you? Can't find any of those stupid horse books anywhere. There's a white trunk in my room. I bet you they're in there. Hopefully we can give them away. I'm gonna go be in the barn. Do you have any carrots? This book says horses like carrots. What about dinner? I gotta go. Well, we eat at six. Don't be late. Okay. Hey, boy, look what I brought you. Something, babe. One. Why won't you eat? How's my horse doing? Good. Um, he's liking his new home. Dad said we're gonna start training him tomorrow. Oh, that's great. Yeah. How's everything else at home? Pretty good. It's uh, just busy. There's a lot of people coming over for Christmas. That should be nice. Yeah, it's just hectic. What, not a fan? No, I like it nice and quiet. I get a lot more work done that way. Did you get my little project finished? Thank you. Oh my gosh. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Yeah, it uh, smells good, by the way. Well, I'll have to sit down and have some dinner. No, 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 I, I can't. I didn't expect you to make dinner for me. Just Come on. I told Lizzie dinner was at 6, and it is... It is almost 6.30, so let's eat. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this food, for wonderful neighbors, for this day, for my granddaughter, and help us to use this food to nourish our bodies. Amen. Amen. So Lizzie's staying for Christmas? Mm-hmm. Her parents have to work. Real estate is a tough business. We got a couple of really big deals closing at the end of the year. Oh, Lizzie. This is James. James, my granddaughter Lizzie. Hi. Is that my dinner? Um, I said dinner was at 6, and it's 6.30 now. So what am I supposed to do, starve? No, I'm sure that there's more carrots in the fridge. Ah! <laughs> I should here. probably go. Don't worry about it, James. She's gonna be fine. She's just a little bit frustrated right now. Will I see you tomorrow? Tomorrow? Yeah, I think that she's gonna need a little bit of help with that pony. I mean, yeah, yeah, I'll have to uh, check with Dad if he needs me to work on the farm, but sure. You tell Phil I said he works you too hard. 
Oh, that reminds me. I promised I'd help him uh, set up the tree. I gotta go. Okay. Thanks for dinner. Thank you. None of these stupid books are telling me anything about taking care of a horse. How am I supposed to know what I'm doing? You told me to take care of him. Let's go inside. I'll make you something to eat. Not until I figure out how to feed him. Why don't we give him a blanket and we'll get you warmed up. How am I supposed to know what I'm supposed to do? You told me to take care of him. I don't know anything about taking care of a stupid horse. It's enough. Okay? Inside the house, dinner time. Fine. This is for you. What is it? Open it. I had a friend of mine make you something. The boy who ate my dinner. A horse. Not just a horse. He was my horse. And his name was Hercules. <laughs> Hercules? Yeah. And he was the best show jumper around. Did you give him away too? I have to go check on the pony. <laughs> Lunch at noon. a name for him. For the pony? Hope. Hope? Yeah. That sounds good. It fits. I know you know why my parents sent me here. But I'm not a bad kid. I know you're not. I didn't mean for it to happen. I just got so tired of everything. Then everything got bad. Why don't you show them you can do something good? What do you mean? Let them know they can trust you. See the good in you. Do you think I could do that with hope? Maybe. Thanks for this. Why don't you clean out the stall? It gets a little bit cold and wet at nighttime. Okay. Yeah. You're gonna be all nice and warm tonight, aren't you? Gotta see this to believe it. Man, that thing's heavy. Yeah, it's heavy. This is a farm. <laughs> Let's go, show me your stuff. All right. Hey. Here you go. 
Yeah, he's been eating hay and carrots all night, haven't you, boy? I don't believe this. You're amazing. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go make breakfast, okay? Be up in 10? Okay. Would you pick up the mail on the way up, please? Sure. <laughs> Good boy. Mm -hmm. timing. Breakfast is ready. You're gonna lose the ranch. What? This letter says the bank's gonna take the ranch from you. You open my mail? So it's true then. You shouldn't open other people's mail, Lizzie. You knew this was gonna happen, didn't you? All the money. How much? A lot. That is none of your business. How did this even happen? Ever since your grandfather died, I have had to run this place on my own. Putting my horses in shows, winning some money. I've gone through my savings, all just to try and make ends meet. You have no idea what it costs to keep a place like this running. It would have been so bad, but last couple of years, some early frost, some of the neighbors just about lost everything. Don had a stroke. And Eileen, she broke her hip. So I finally took out a loan on the property to help them out. Why would you do that if you didn't even have money for yourself? These people are like family to me. Ever since your grandfather died, they have been there for me, checking in on me, taking care of me, and fixing things up around the ranch. And what about the horses? I had to sell them to stay current with a loan. Just like that, you sold them? I did what I had to. So you're just going to let the bank take the branch from you? Yes. Can't those neighbors help you? Can't mom and dad help you at least? There's got to be a way, Grandma. I won't ask your parents. And I can't ask the neighbors. They're still struggling. They're trying to keep their own heads above water. I don't understand. The thing is, nobody knows these farms like the people that are already farming the land. But what really boils my bones are those vultures. The bankers and the developers are just sitting around waiting for a late payment so they can snatch up the property and knock down the barns, get rid of all the animals. Put up a subdivision. And that's what they want to do to my ranch. Charles would be heartbroken. So you're just going to give up? No, that pony was my last hope. I was going to train him for show jumping, win some competitions, sell him and get back on top of things again. And now he's too weak and I'm too tired. I don't have any more time. So that's it then? We have this last Christmas together, you and me. And I'm glad to spend it here with you. There was nobody at the house, so I, I figured I'd come down here. What do you want? Well, uh, Mary said you might need my help. Did she? Yeah, I know a lot about horses. Well, I got Hope eating again, so I don't need you. Leave! Look, I'm sorry I ate your dinner. You know, it's hard to say no to your grandma. She asked me to eat with her. All right, she's like a family friend. You're friends with my grandma? Yeah. 
We've been neighbors since I was born. She's pretty much family to us. Did my grandma give your family money? Yeah. Last year after the bad frost. Why? Then why don't you guys just pay her back? What? My grandma doesn't have enough money to keep this place going, and your family owes her money. So if you guys don't pay her back, she's going to lose this place. I swear I didn't know. If my family could afford that to help her, we would, but I know we don't have that kind of money. So my grandma is just going to lose everything and everyone while you guys just watch? I'm sorry. I don't know what to do. Just leave. Anything about training horses for show jumping? I mean, me and my brother used to ride in competitions when I was younger. So do you? Well, yeah. Come with me. I don't want this to be your last Christmas here, Grandma. Oh, Lizanne, sweetheart, I'm sorry. You can't lose this ranch. Well, what else am I gonna do? You have hope. Hope? Yes. I'm too tired, and I don't have the time to train a horse. Well, I'm here now. And? And I'm going to train him for show jumping, and we will win you the money to save the ranch. <laughs> Sweetheart, you don't know how to train a horse for show jumping. With James and a little help from you, I will. You're, you're serious? You really want to do this? It takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. I know. And I do want to do this. And you know how stubborn I am. What do we got to lose? Awesome. Come on. What? Oh. Grandma's in. Look at this place. There's no tree, there's no lights, there's no garland. This place looks horrible for Christmas. You need to go home, get as many spare decorations as you can, visit other farms if you have to, and ask them for some too. Go now. Better do like she says. And hurry up. Hope's training starts now. I'm going to go change my shirt. OK, the first thing you're going to have Hope do is walk over these poles. Now, he's got to walk over them. He's going to be a little bit hesitant, but that's your job. After that, you will run over it, and he will trot behind you. After a while, he'll actually like to do it. So it's going to work on his confidence his gait and his rhythm. It's really important for him to develop that, OK? All right, what else? Over here. What happens here is these two poles get put in the cups on either side. It's called an X. Why don't you hold them for a minute? So one goes in this cup, one in the other cup. Any pony can jump this, but you got to wait until Hope gets stronger to handle the fences, OK? How long do you think it'll take him to do that? When he's ready. but. You can't push him. I don't want him or you to get hurt. I'd never hurt Hope. I know you wouldn't hurt him. You just have to be careful. I know my parents think I'm a total screw-up that doesn't care about anything or anybody, but I'm in this, Grandma. I'm not going to screw it up. I know I can do this. I believe you can. Ready to get started? Yeah. Come on. Come on, boy. What do you got for us? This is all the stuff my parents aren't using. Your leftovers? Well, it's all still good stuff. Here, let's take a look. Okay. 
What do you think? Good enough, I guess. Go ahead and take it on up to the house, then come back out and help me with Hope. We'll be back in later, Grandma. Come on. Oh, that girl. Oh, guess I've got my work cut out for me this afternoon. I haven't put up decorations in a long time. How come? Mm, kind of lost the enthusiasm once Charles died. I mean, you don't have to decorate if you don't want to. <laughs> no, it's for Lizzie. Yeah, good How come uh, her parents brought her here? Just getting in a little bit of trouble at home. She doesn't seem that bad to me. No, no I don't think she is. Why don't you go help her? Want to take this up to the house? Maybe even take a little nap. You worked really hard today. Yeah. It's getting a lot stronger, too. Yeah. I think I'm going to have him run the exits tomorrow. When did you find out you were coming here to your grandma's? A couple days ago. Do you like it here? I mean, it like must be so different than the city. Yeah. <laughs> do you feel different out here? What do you mean? Out in the country, like, does it make you feel different? I mean, Mary told me that your parents brought you here because of something bad you did. And? I don't know. You don't seem so bad to me. Why not? I don't know. I guess I just don't believe it. Well, you should. You don't know me, so don't act like you do. What'd you do? I got in trouble with a couple of my friends. It was an accident, stupid. We had a couple of drinks and we all fell asleep. The curtains must have caught on fire because I woke up to flames and screaming. Was anybody hurt? We were all rushed to the hospital because of all the smoke we were breathing in. It was pretty bad. Your parents must have freaked. Yeah. What about your house? It's fine. The firefighters got there in time, so only the living room was ruined. Wow. Yeah. So that's why they brought you here? They're never going to trust me again. But it was just an accident. Yeah, it was, but they're also mad at me for my grades. Oh, are you doing bad in school? Yeah. <laughs> I got suspended. Hmm. Why? I skipped too much. But my parents didn't notice until the principal called to tell them that I got suspended. I've never even had a detention. Well, good for you. My parents had me on lockdown for a week after I was suspended. And that's when the fire happened. So that's why they brought you here? It was stupid, I get that, but I'm not a bad kid. And I hate that I think I am. Um, they're never gonna trust me again. They always look so sad when they look at me now. Well, you can't be all that bad. Hope still trusts you. Yeah. I know. That's why I can't let him down. Made this for me? Yeah. It was a gift for you. Your grandma asked me to. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> what do you think? It looks great. I was hoping to surprise you. I forgot what a chore this was. It's a lot of hard work. <laughs> it's been a lot of years since I did all this Christmas decorating. I like being here for Christmas. I like having you here for Christmas. Hope's training is going really well. Yep. Yeah. I think you're doing a great job with him. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I think that's about it. Do you help me with this box over here? Sure. Oh, 
This place is starting to look pretty incredible. It is. You know, when your dad was little, Grandpa Charles used to decorate for every holiday, every single room in this ranch. <laughs> and then he got sick and it became more of a chore, so I kind of stopped. How long's it been since he passed? Gosh, it's been eight years. Time flies. Do you think about him a lot? Sometimes I do. Other times, not as much. But I tell you, when he died, I sure was mad at God at first. But not anymore? Mm, no. I forgave him. Besides, I know I'm going to see Charles again one day. And I've got so much to be grateful for right here. Grandma, I'm not going to be able to give you a present for Christmas this year. That's okay, sweetie. I was in such a bad mood when I left. I didn't think about getting anything for anybody. I tell you what, you get Hope fit and healthy and that will be the best Christmas present you could give me, okay? Okay. Well, I'm pooped. I couldn't pick up another ornament. Thanks for your help today. Yeah, it was fun. You must be tired, too. I don't know who's working harder, you or Hope. Oh, no. It's so much fun for me. I love him. So have you heard from your parents lately? Have you called them? No. Why not? I don't see the point. Have they tried to call you? I don't know. I haven't checked my phone because it's been off. What if they're trying to get a hold of you? I don't want to talk to them. Besides, they dumped me here for Christmas anyway, so they don't have to talk to me. That's not true. Then why? Because they were worried about you. Whatever. You know, Lizzie, if you can handle raising a horse, I think you can handle a phone call. Can I go now? You too. <laughs> right. Let's get you out and do some training today. <laughs> Did you have a good night's sleep, Hope? <laughs> I'm hoping you at least did. Seems like you did. Grandma's mad at me for me not wanting to call my parents last night. I don't see why I should, I've got nothing to say to them. Hey, not cool. Did you know your mom and dad, Hope? But they were great show jumpers. And I bet Grandma knew them, and she trained them into something great. You can trust me, Hope. We're gonna be something great, too. All right, here's your carrot. <laughs> Every memory that fights to take me under Every obstacle that stands against my way Every heart that learns to breathe in a hard reality to
I dare to put one foot in front of the other If I speak the words that I cannot yet see Will you meet me straight ahead Turn this fear to face instead I'm on my knees So please believe for me and I'll believe for you Cause I need this thing to happen Need to know it's true It was really great today, I hope. And I think when I first got here, you could barely walk. You're gonna save Grandma's ranch. Hey, Mary. Hey, James. Brought more Christmas decorations. Careful, thank you. you. Want me to just leave them here? That's a good place. What are you making? Christmas chocolate pecan pie. Oh, yum. Is it, um, is it hard to make pies? Not too hard. Oh. Are you gonna ask me where Lizzie is? What? Where? No, I was... Just bring in uh, more decorations. Just in case you're curious, she may be in the barn. Ah, uh, I should have known she'd be with Hope. Mm-hmm. Dinner's at six. Yeah, uh, what are we eating? James, you came here to see Lizzie, right? Go, see her. Don't be late. Hey, Lizzie. Another hard day of training? Yeah. I could get used to this. You mean the ranch? I've lived on a farm my whole life. Really? <laughs> yeah. I want to go to college in the city, but Dad won't let me go. Why not? Well, he wants me to help run the farm. And you don't want to? Not really. But uh, I don't really have a choice. I'm the only one left at home. Oh, you're an only kid too? No, no. My uh, older sister, Samantha, about two years ago, she eloped with some guy from California and uh, they ran off together. So she doesn't talk to us anymore. Uh -huh. Then my brother, Zach, joined the Navy. I want to go visit him. But you can't. No, we don't have that kind of money. So, Dad wants me to help take over the farm. Well, if you could go to school, what would you study? My mom always says that I'd do great at an art school. Really, art? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She thinks I've got talent, but uh, I'm not so sure. No, you do have talent. You made me that horse that was beautiful. Nah, that, that's, that's easy. Besides, that's not real art. I mean, I can't, like, draw or paint that well or anything. Well, I think it's real art. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You know, I've got, like, probably about 100 more of those at home. You should really start showing people those. I know they think it's art, too. You should definitely look into selling them. You think so? Yeah. I'll think about it. I just love this view. Yeah. Hey, I need to see how Hope's doing. I just put him up. I need to see how he is progressing now. But he's resting. I know you worked hard. We still got more work to do. I may have to put Hope on the training circuit sooner than I thought. I'm not gonna rush him. 
Let's get him out. Is everything okay? I don't know. I got a call from the bank, and I just have to see how he's doing. Okay. Yeah, good boy. See how strong he's gotten? Yeah, you're looking great. He's looking great. <laughs> yeah, he's not sick at all anymore, are you, boy? I need to see him tackle that fence. I don't want to rush him. Lizzie, if you want me to keep the ranch, he's got to be able to handle that. Yeah, don't worry, Lizzie. That's what all this training has been for. Okay, boy. This is it. You've done such a great job with him. I couldn't have done better myself. Really? Yeah, seriously. So what happens now? You keep training him. He's not quite ready to compete. And in the meantime, I'm going to start looking up some show jumping competitions to enter him into at the beginning of the year. He's not too young? No. He's just going to be competing against other ponies his age. He'll be fine. Good. I want to stay here till he's done with training. Here on the ranch? Yeah. I would love that. We're both hungry. I know I am. Lizzie? There's a woman with a group of people down at the barn. What are you doing here? This is private property. If you'd like to take a step inside, go ahead on in. Mrs. Evans, I don't know if you remember me. I'm Erin Cooper. Yeah, from the bank. Yes. Who are those people? What are you doing here? They're here to see the ranch. What for? We're choosing a realtor to list the property. What? Mrs. Evans, the bank has been more than fair. You haven't made a payment in six months. I had some unexpected expenses, but I'm, I'm working on rebuilding right now. I have a show pony. This could... ranch is the only reason that the bank gave you this loan of this magnitude in the first place. I'm sorry that you're having personal difficulties. Okay, so now what? Now the bank sets out to search for a new owner for the ranch and its surrounding land. You can't do that. This is my ranch. It's my home. Actually, we can. And we are. You signed a note. You're six months delinquent. The bank is merely trying to get back its investment. I'm sorry. It's just business. Business? No, this is my life. You were warned that failure to pay would result in loss of property. I just need a little bit more time to get him into competition and get him trained, and then I will be current on, on the loan payments. There is no more time. But the show season starts in a month. If you can begin to make payments for the debt that you owe in a matter that will satisfy the bank, you'll get more time to get current on your loan. In what manner would that be? A slight bump to $3,500 a month. Okay. Okay. Your next payment's on the 24th. Of December? That's in a few days. I know. On Christmas Eve? The bank is open till 1 o'clock. Look, it's simple. 
Make the payments or we foreclose. Who are they? It was a banker with a bunch of realtors. What were they doing here? They came to look at the ranch. She wants me to make a payment by Monday. I think it's over. No. You said I had enough time to finish training Hope. I thought I'd have at least a couple more months. They have to give you more time. Hope's almost ready. They don't care about that. They want $3,500 on Christmas Eve. Then just give them the money, pay them. I don't have that much money. This is stupid. What if there was a horse show between now and then? We could win the money. By Monday. There's no shows until the new year. So what are you gonna do, just give up and sit back and watch them take the ranch from you? What else can I do? I am not gonna lose this ranch. I refuse to let that happen. Lizzie, please! Go. See if she's okay. Are you all right, Lizzie? Would you just leave me alone? I wish I never came to this place. Hey, it's gonna be okay. Don't say that it's gonna be okay. Nothing is gonna be okay. All this is gonna be gone and it's partly your family's fault. Your pathetic, poor family. No wonder your stupid siblings left. <laughs> I just wanna leave this place. Would you think about someone else for a change? What? All you care about is yourself. How do you think Mary feels? How do you think I feel? Okay, yeah, I know my family is partly responsible. I can't help that, I wish I could. You don't even realize how mean you're being. We were becoming good friends. You were finally starting to get along with your grandma and now because of, because of your temper, you're ruining everything. I was happy here. I was bringing hope back to life and saving this ranch, but now... Now what? Now that your plan to redeem yourself is over, what are you gonna do? Your grandma is in there right now, alone. She's having to deal with this by herself because you're in here. Just go be with her. Just go home, James! I never want to see you again! I'm gone, Lizzie. Good. <laughs> James? I'm sorry I can't stay for dinner, Mary. How's Lizzie?
I'm so sorry. What's gonna happen to Hope? I don't know. I just don't know. You're gonna get rid of him, aren't you? You don't understand. It's not that simple. This ranch and these horses have been my whole life. And when your grandpa died, I had to make some really hard decisions. I don't regret it. I'd still do it all over again. How can you say that? It cost you everything. It cost me a lot. But I helped some very dear friends save their farms, and it's only money. Yeah, but you ended up screwing yourself over and all of your horses, including Hope. No. I took care of my horses. And I'll take care of Hope. If I have to find him a home, I will. You mean sell him? Maybe. But I don't want you to. I don't want anybody else to have him. I don't have too many options left, Lizzie. What else am I supposed to do? I can't lose him. It's not the end of the world. Life goes on. Whatever. I'm going inside now. I don't care where you go. Got a lot of things to think about. A lot of decisions to be made. I'll come inside when you're ready. Everything. Um, now it's all for sale. Whatever you want. Oh, you're helping me out. Mm-hmm. So this afternoon? That would be great. First come, first serve. Uh, give Beth and Mac a call, too, for me. All right, appreciate it. Thanks. I know what to do. I know how to save the ranch. I'm already making a No, Grandma, listen to me. You have to trust me. What is it? Come on. 
Follow me. We don't have any time to lose. What are you doing? I am calling my parents. What for? I don't want you to involve them. We're going to need their help if this is going to work. If what's going to work? It's ringing. Hey, Mom, it's me. You and Dad get to Grandma's ranch as soon as possible. I'll explain it when you get here. All right, bye. Okay, let's go downstairs. Bring your phone. Lizzie, just stop. You've got to tell me what is going on in that brain of yours. Call every person that you know and call in every favor that you can. What for? We're going to turn the ranch into a Christmas market. A Christmas market? Yes. Call all the farms that you saved and have them bring vegetables, fruits, food, drinks, crafts, anything and everything. What if they can't? You saved them, Grandma, and now you need their help. They owe you. A Christmas market? Yes. We'll have the tables all set up in the barn with the merchandise. We'll have Christmas music playing and hopefully even be one of the attractions. I don't think something like that'll work. Trust me, Grandma, it will. You really believe it? I do. Now get calling. We need as much help as we can get. Everybody? Yes. Okay, I don't need you over my shoulder. Go. Okay. Lizzie. Are you all right? You guys came. We kept trying to call you back, but you didn't pick up, and your grandmother's not answering. What's going on? Are you okay? I'm sorry, my phone was off. And then out of the blue, you tell us to get here as quickly as you can. You've got us really worried, Lizzie. I'm gonna save Grandma's ranch. Save it? Did you guys know Grandma was in a lot of debt? Yeah, well, you shouldn't know that. Well, we need to raise $3,500, or else the bank's gonna take the ranch from her. Lizzie, where's your grandmother? She's in the house, probably making phone calls. All right, I, I, I've got to go talk to her. I just need you guys to help me out here. What do you need? I have some more of these tables in the back of the house, so we just need to bring him out here to the barn and set him up. But we need to move fast. OK, come on, let's go. OK, Charlie, that's great. Thank you. All right, I'll see you tomorrow then, bright and early. OK. Merry Christmas. What's going on, Mom? Are you really in that much trouble? Apparently I am. A lady from the bank came by and has given me until Christmas Eve to come up with a very inflated loan payment. You should have asked me if you needed help. I don't want you to lose this place. David, you and Susan have enough problems of your own. I wasn't going to burden you with this, too. Besides, all things happen for a reason. There's got to be something we can do. Lizzie's doing something. What'd she do now? Apparently, she's saving the ranch. Mom, um, she's a 16-year-old girl. How's she going to be able to do that? She's smart. And she's very creative. <laughs> and so determined. I'm listening to her. Now go. I've got things to do. Um, all right, but what do you need me to do? Go see Lizzie. I'm sure she's got a list for you, too. She's in charge? Yes, she's in charge. She wants to be trusted with this. Do you? Do you trust her? She really cares about this place. Give her a chance to show it. Rhoda. Hi, it's Mary. Listen, something has come up, and, well, I've got a big favor to ask you. I'd really like it if you and Dad would stay for market tomorrow. Lizzie, we have to work. Figures. I'll call into the office, and we have to ask your grandma if it's okay. She won't mind. You really think this is gonna work? Yeah. It's going to be a beautiful market, Mom. What are we selling? Whatever people bring us. Things should be coming in any minute now. <laughs> well, what else do we have to do to set up for tomorrow? I can't think of anything right now, so I think we're good. 
but I'll let you know if anything comes up. Okay, sounds great. Oh my goodness. It's beautiful. Andy. Hi, Mary. Oh. Oh, gorgeous. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Lizzie. Hi. Thank you. All of this is from the McDougals. Part of that money from the loan is saved their ranch. And it's all a gift. That's so amazing. I know. Well, where do we put them? Oh, that's the boss. Hey, Mom, Dad, can you come help us put some of these over there? We're going to be selling them right tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. Are they going to be OK overnight? Yeah, they should be fine. The barn gets really cold at night, so they'll be good, especially since How we're selling How do you know that? I mean, he stayed there overnight. You let Lizzie sleep in the barn? I may have. How come you wouldn't when I was a kid? He's pretty special. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, Mary asked me to. She did? Yeah. There you are, you little blighter. <laughs> Hold on a moment. What is going on here? Much obliged, Pastor Newton. Now, if you'll just hold him, I'll give him to Cain any deserves. As a point of personal privilege, sir, no one shall be whipped in my presence. Then you deal with him. What has he done wrong? Sir, fighting with the other boys, disobedience, swearing. He tipped over me stall. Oh, sir, he's a bad seed. These are serious charges. I'm serious, sir. Please, stand back and let me give him the cane he deserves. Not in my presence, Mr. Chapman. Fine. He's your problem. You deal with him. A washman to the little cad. Huh. Thank you, sir. Fighting, eh? Swearing? These are serious charges. You're Mrs. Watson's oldest, aren't you? Aye, she's me stepmom. Hmm. Well, I was about to go inside for a spot of tea. Would you like to join me? Might there be any biscuits? Well, there might be. Let's go see. <laughs>
So, fighting and swearing. You wouldn't understand. No? How could you? you you're the poor sin and all. I think I might understand much better than you think. I was once a little boy myself. But I think uh, by the time I was your age, I'd been expelled from two different schools for fighting and swearing. You? Never. Hmm. Yes, I wasn't always a church parson, you know. In fact, I've been a great many different things in life. And I've probably done things far worse than fighting and swearing. Like what? Well, I was a cabin boy on a ship. I was a ship's captain later on. I was even a slave for a while. Nah, sir. You're leading me on. No, I'm not. Would you like to hear a little of my story? Well... Are there more biscuits? <laughs> there might be, yes, and more tea as well. Of course, it was all a very long time ago, you understand, but... I don't think that little boys have really changed that much, do you? I remember my dear mother as if it were only a few weeks ago. She taught me to pray. She taught me to read by reading me the scriptures. She died when I was only six. My father was a merchant seaman, a captain. While I'm sure that he loved me in his own way, I don't recall ever feeling loved by him. He soon remarried a beautiful young woman bore him other children. She wasn't terribly interested in me, and so he was away at sea, and I ended up in boarding school. It wasn't long before I was expelled from that school for the same sort of trouble you've been in. You mean fighting? I and general disobedience. When I was young, I had this hot core of anger inside of me that burned all the time, and it was out of control. I couldn't control my actions always. I... You do understand, don't you? It wasn't long before I was expelled from the next school for the same thing, and my father decided that the only thing to be done was to take me to sea, and so I went on a ship with him when I was 11. We served as cabin boys, carrying and cleaning and doing whatever any grown-up sailor wanted done. But that burning core of anger was still inside me. And when it would burn, I would always end up in trouble. Dar, suck on that, young Master Newton. Maybe you'll think twice about splinging blasphemies around in me galley. I took my anger out on the other boys, the ones who were smaller than I, and ended up in trouble again. But in spite of the trouble I got into, I grew into a man aboard merchant ships. And I became an able-bodied seaman. Ship leaves next Wednesday for Jamaica. We can use you if you'll sign on. Aye, sir, I will. I'll be visiting in Kent for a few days, but I can be back for Wednesday. Little did I know how those few days in Kent would affect the rest of my life. For it was there, staying with friends of my mother, that I met the love of my life, my Polly. Her name was Mary, Mary Catlett. And almost from the first time I saw her, my heart was a captive. My secret nickname for her was Polly, my dear Polly, my beloved. She was a little younger than I, and her beautiful smile melted my heart and made a permanent mark upon my soul. Mr. Newton, I shall speak plainly. We loved your dear mother and held in the highest regard. Mary is too young yet for any decision. But her father and I do not object to an understanding, provided... Yes? Provided that when you return from your voyages, we will see some signs of stability and of prospect. Prospect? Prospect for living, Mr. Newton, is of great importance. Yes. I shall keep that in mind, Mrs. Catlett, and I shall return. Now I went back to sea with a goal in mind, to make my way, to find advancement, to make my fortune, so that I could return and marry my dear Polly.
the beautiful memory of her smile, of her sweet face, got me through many long watches and lonely nights at sea. But even the memory of her smile could not keep me from trouble. That hot anger burned inside me still and would boil over at times. Sent him to the surgery. Then you knew me. You're on report. Reduce rations for a week. And of course, I was a seaman at sea, no different from any other. When at port, I joined heartily in the sins that waited any sailor. But not all temptations were in port. Ah, you're a fool if you believe all that blather. All this can be explained by reason and science. Ah, there's no god up there. The rationalists have it, right? Is that what you do when you're off duty? Read philosophers? Aye. There's lots of hours at sea, John. Lots of time to think. Hobbes, Voltaire. They make more sense than a pack of priests mumbling Latin. Nothing but superstition to control the rest of us. You should read off Salonia's book, Leviathan. And so I too became a sailor philosopher of sorts. Spinoza and Hobbes often made quite a deal of sense, and just as often made me doubt the simple faith of my childhood. One night at sea, I fell asleep over a book, and I had the strangest dream, one that would come back to me again and again throughout my life. As long as you preserve this ring, you will be successful and happy. But should you lose it or part with it, you must only expect sorrow and distress. You believe that ring is magic? As long as I preserve and keep it, I should be happy and successful. Ha <laughs> ha, are you naughty boy? What a simpleton. You believe anything you're told, don't you? It seemed right. What's right about it? Some stranger hands you a ring, tells you it's magic, it's a talisman, and you believe him? What a poltroon! Seriously, John, how can you buy such clap crap? To ascribe magical powers to a wee piece of metal shaped in a circle? Oh, I'd be ashamed to admit such superstitions to another man. Don't you understand that by subscribing to such superstitions it saps your own human powers of reason? Throw it away. Go on. Throw it away. Create your own fate. Take control of your own destiny. Go on! Throw it away! Go on! Go on! Show you're a man! Now you're lost. 
For that ring contained in it all the mercy I deserve for you. And now it's gone. It's your own hand. brought it back for you. <gasps> no. If you were to be entrusted with this ring again, you would soon bring yourself to the same distress. You are not able to keep it. But I will preserve it for you. And whenever it is needful, I will produce it on your behalf. It wasn't long before that voyage was nearing its end and I would be able to return to Kent to visit my Polly. As the ship turned home, all my thoughts had turned to her in the prospect of again seeing her sweet face. But it was not to be. Less than five miles from her house, I encountered a press gang. These were the days of an impending war with France, and the Navy needed fresh men all the time. Press gangs roamed the country, authorized to virtually kidnap a lightly young lad and press him into the service of His Majesty's Navy. Run! It's a press gang! He's awake. Welcome to His Majesty's Navy. What's your name, son? <clears throat> John Newton. See? Aye. Right. Day out of Liverpool. You was the last conscript brought on board. Here, drink something. It'll help you feel better. HMS Orange, newly commissioned man of war, under the command of Captain Carteret. We're on our way to France to defend king and country. We're always fighting with France or Spain, ever since Eve bit that apple. I was on my way to propose to my beloved. Oh, it's a shame. Four years will be out, I expect. Four years? Aye. <sighs> Thank you. 
captured, carried away from my love against my will, imprisoned at sea. Each day on the ocean took me further from Polly and increased my resentment. Hey, Johnny! Johnny! You've got to get along with the other sailors. We've all got our crosses to bear. Leave me alone. The smoldering anger that had always burned in me was now a fire of resentment. I obeyed orders. I did my job, but I did so with a sullen attitude. In my mind, God himself had cheated me. Why did you do this to me? Am I such a sinner that you had to single me out for special punishment? I have nothing to do with you. But I was no fool. I soon perceived that I had a greater chance of liberty if I was promoted. And so I began to focus all my rage into hard work and efforts to please the officers not because I had any true respect for them, but because I saw it as my opportunity for a change. So I started to work hard. Aye, sir. And I showed officers great respect. Newton. Aye, sir. Good job, Seaman. Thank you, sir. At least to their faces. Wish to see me, sir. Aye, Mr. Newton. Your father is a merchant captain. Aye, sir. I have heard good things of him. He's written me asking that I consider you for advancement. I have spoken to the mate, and he says that you have been an exemplary seaman. I try my best, sir. That's the attitude. What would you say to being promoted to midshipman? Aye, sir. I would like that very much. Didn't think you'd refuse. So be it. You are promoted to midshipman. Being a midshipman meant that I was a sort of apprentice officer, and I was set over my former mates. Come on, you sluggards, get to work! Pull that mopping over back, clean up, you can eat off of. Aye, sir. Set the topsail! Belay the shrouds! Sails mended, seamen. While I behaved with perfect form to my superiors, the rage inside me often was taken out on the sailors who were now under me, much as I had once bullied smaller children. You call that a knot, seamen? Aye, sir. Figure of eight. It's a floppy mess. Take it apart and start again. Aye, sir. Walk back and there'll be no rations for you tonight. Aye, sir. After some months at sea patrolling the channel and even fighting skirmishes with French ships, put back into Plymouth for repairs, and then it was that I had my chance. Mr. Newton, while we have repairs, I'm going to permit a rotation of shore leave to the seamen. I'm assigning you to go ashore with them and supervise to make sure none of them desert. Aye, sir. It was as if the master had left the cat to guard the cream. I'll be back at sunset. Anyone not here and ready to return to the ship should be counted as deserting and shall feel the lash. Aye, Aye sir. sir. All right, off with you. 
Here at last was my chance to go see my Polly. I wasn't much on thinking things through in those days, and it didn't really occur to me that desertion would catch up with me. Desertion from His Majesty's Navy. Mr. John Newton, charged with desertion from His Majesty's Royal Navy. A charge punishable by death when found guilty by court martial, or lesser punishment by a ship's captain as defined by Article 16 of the Articles of War. Captain, what shall be the punishment? He shall be demoted from his present position and stripped of all rank. He shall be tied to the main mast and administered 12 lashes with the cap. Let each of you witness what happened to those who deserve His Majesty's service. No one shall speak a word to Mr. Newton for seven days. No one shall show him favor. No one shall share any ration with him, other than the bread and water assigned by the galley master. Are these instructions clear? I I sir. Sir. You got your own now, don't you, Mr. High and Mighty? More than what you deserve. Enjoy your meal, sir. Sleep in a hammock from now on. You up swabbing the deck in no time. Mr. Jensen? Pass the word to Mr. Jensen. Mr. Smythe? Pass the word to Mr. Smythe. Mr. Newton. I said Mr. Newton, sir. Pass the word to Mr. Newton. The captain had conscripted two gunners from a passing ship. Maritime law required that he replace them with able-bodied seamen so that the civilian ship would not be short-handed. This gave Captain Carteret the perfect opportunity to get rid of some troublemakers. Able-bodied seamen, my ass. Two of you were scurvy and one barely recovered from the scourge. Well, I can tell you, you'll feel the cat again. You disobey on this ship. Aye, sir. Aye, sir. This is a slave ship. We'll be 18 months on the Triangle. Serve well, and you'll be rewarded. Serve poorly, and you'll be punished. Understood? Aye, Aye sir. Dismissed.
I came to like many of the sailors on the Levant. The old rage still burned inside me. But now, it was directed all at the captain. That's a sloppy bit of work there, Mr. Newton. That's the way you worked on the orange. No wonder you were flogged. Aye, right, listen up, mates. I've come with a little song about old Mr. Phelps up here. Did you ever see the likes since you've been to sea? Let the good ship rock. A panty-legged captain with a bent-back knee wobbling down the dock. Wobbling down the dock. Let the good ship roll and rock. Better call a cobbler to cobble up the wobbler. We'll anchor at the Banana Islands in Sierra Leone tomorrow. I'll need a crew of three to roll me in to meet with the trader. Harkness, Smythe, and, and Newton. The following day, we'll sail to Cockerell Bay where we'll load the cargo. I like that. Man could think about staying here, he could. You like what you see then? Do I? I'll bet yon trader there lives like a king. What's not to like? What do you think, Newton? Ah, uh, you both are daft. It might be nice for a while. I want to get back to England. I want to see my Polly. Smythe, Harkness, make ready the boat. Newton, you stay here with me. Mr. Campbell, this is Mr. Newton, the young man I was telling you about. It's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. <laughs> you won't be so pleased once you understand the deal. I've traded you, Mr. Newton. You'll stay here as a servant. How do you like them apples, Mr. Funny Man? So you've met a lash. You'll meet again soon enough if you don't serve well. You're my property now, Newton. And there's no way off this island without me knowledge or me permission. So don't you go be getting any bright ideas. You have to be a servant for me, wife. Self-aware. Do as you're told. Your life will be much easier. But you buck against and you'll find out just how hard a life can be. You guard, take him to pay high. She's always wanted to have a white man as a slave. Now she's got one. He is not much to look at, is he? Give him a mat and chain him behind the house. First, we must break him. My defiance, my sins, had all caught up with me. I was a slave. They gave me only a little to eat for days. Just enough to drink to keep me alive.
take the chains off today. You are P.I.'s slave. Do you understand? You must do exactly as she bids. If you try to run away, we will hurt you and chain you. If you disobey, you will be whipped. If you try to run away twice, we will kill you slowly in a way that will make you wish for death to come. Do you understand? Now go and serve your mistress. Ah, my little white man. Oh, you must be so terribly hungry. How could you have treated my little white man so badly? Here, let me give you some food. You would like something to eat. Wouldn't you? I'm sure you would. I'm sure you are starving. The food will taste so good. She worked me like a mule. She seemed to take particular delight in watching me suffer, often making me do chores that were simply pointless. Ah, very good. Now that you have placed the logs here, put them back and place them exactly where you found them. <laughs> No time! No time! You are useless, even as a slave. For a long time, I felt nothing but hunger and despair. I could never forget that I was the lowest form of life on the island. Even the native slaves had thatched huts to live in, while I had to sleep on the ground under the stars. On the other hand, Campbell and P.I. lived in a great brick house at the center of the island. I was seldom allowed in the big house, and then only to do menial labor. But 
as long as I obeyed P.I.'s abusive commands, they fed me a little, and I regained some strength in mind as well as body. One night I lay looking at the expanse of the heavens. I began to try and see how many constellations I could identify, how many stars I could name. This became a nightly game that became a private area of freedom for me. And I began to dream again of my dear Polly, my beautiful Polly. I wonder if I will ever see her again. Then one night, it seemed to me that a group of stars formed a circle, a ring, a constellation I had never seen before and never since. It may have been my eyes playing a trick, or perhaps a planet had wandered into an unusual position visible from this latitude. But that night, I could indeed see a ring, a ring like the one in my dream. You're not able to keep it. but. I will preserve it for you, and whenever it is needful, I will produce it on your behalf. During the days when P.I. was in a mood, I would work very hard. But then there would be hours of boredom when there was nothing to do. One day, I found a small lime tree growing near the village that seemed much like me, beaten and starving, despairing of life. I adopted that little tree as my own and began to take care of it, to water and to fertilize it. I found other seedlings and planted them in what became my own little garden. One day, Campbell had me move heavy crates into the big house. I was alone for a few moments, and there I came upon a dusty old geometry book. I took it and hid it under my mat. I began in my spare time to work geometry problems, scratching diagrams in the sand. Using the sun and the shadow of my little lime tree, I calculated the latitude and longitude of the islands we were on, which were commonly called the Banana Islands. Just like the stars, like the little lime tree, it gave me something to focus on, a space that was mine, and mine alone. There was little I could do with the knowledge, but the exercise did much to keep my mind occupied and sharp. One day, when I was tending to my little garden and passing the time with equations written in the sand, Mr. Campbell and P.I. walked down the path and caught sight of what I was doing. Newton, what are you doing, man? Are you growing your own limes? <laughs> I was terrified that P.I., as cruel as she was, would make me destroy my little place of sanity. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows? Maybe one day before those trees are full grown, you can sail back to England and you can be the captain of your own boat. Then you can come back here and enjoy the fruits of your labors. <laughs> then again, perhaps you will become the king of Poland. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Do you understand the mathematics? Yes, sir. I taught myself. Hmm. Oh. Might not be a complete waste after all. Here are a set of equations. I'd like for you to solve them. What is it? A test? Aye, if you will. I want to see just how good you are with these mathematics. Sit down, sit down.
I'm in need of a clerk to manage my factory in Kittim. There are not very many people in Sierra Leone who understand numbers. Factory? Aye. It's my slave trading post. It's where the Bombo bring in slaves from the interior and make them ready for transport to the West Indies. My brother runs the factory, but he's in need of someone who can keep the accounts. You will go there. You will serve him now. The guard will take you. At Kittum, my life changed dramatically. I had new, clean clothes to wear. Angus Campbell treated me well, almost as an equal. Bombo treated me with respect, inviting me to their feasts. I thought of Polly often. Before long, I had given up any hope of ever returning to England. My circumstance had changed from one of daily despair one of comfort. I had all I needed, food, shelter, clothing, respect, and even women. Thoughts of England faded, and my life in Kitten began to envelop every part of my being. The other settlers even had an expression for it. They called it going native. Then came the day when my entire world would suddenly change again, as if a lightning bolt had struck. Mr. Newton, I'm out here to see you. Mr. New, Mr. John New. Yes. I'm Archibald Gother, captain of the HMS Greyhound, out of Liverpool. Uh, welcome, Captain Gother. You're here to pick up a shipment. Not exactly. You see, I'm here to take you home. Me? What are you talking about? Your father commissioned me to find you and bring you back to England, whatever the cost. I've been stopping at every trading post south of the Canaries searching for you. And finally, here you are. My father. Mr. Nutter! She is a greyhound. After this, we've got two more ports of call to pick up ivory and beeswax. And then we shall set sail for Liverpool. And for you, home. Captain Gotha, a month ago I would have told you I had no hope or even dream of seeing England again. I was prepared to live out my days here. Perhaps marry a native. Even have my grave right here in West Africa. 
If I believed in God, I would say his hand had brought you here. Believe it. Where else can it be? So I began my journey home, not as a crewman, but as a passenger on the Greyhound. Freed of the duties I was used to, I had many hours at sea to think, to think about my life, to think about life itself. It was during these long hours of leisure that I discovered a book, The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akimpis. I began reading it, not as a meditational work, but as a work of fiction, an entertainment to pass the time. But as I read, the involuntary suggestion came to me. What if these words were true? What if the faith of this long dead writer was in fact a reality that I simply did not understand? I could not bear the inference as it related to myself. Dimly remembered scripture verses came unbidden to my mind, especially fearful passages that speak of the judgment of those who know the way of truth, but then depart from it. What if I were one of them? What if the faith I had abandoned was in fact the driving reality of the universe? What if God's hand had in fact been the moving force that brought me to this point? Brought Gotha to Sierra Leone to rescue me? What if I had turned my back on the very God who sought to save me? I was so caught up in my own thoughts and meditation that I had not even been aware of the storm that had engulfed us.
you. I thought back then on that powerful recurring dream that had haunted my life. I will preserve it for you. And whenever it is needful, I will produce it on your behalf. We had survived the most terrifying storm of my life at sea. But more than that, I had a glimmer of new hope, a spark of faith in my heart. In my darkest moment, I discovered a chance of reconciliation with a God that I had long dismissed as mere fiction. That was March 10th, 1748, a day that I would mark for the rest of my life as the day of my conversion. There is little doubt that our very cargo had saved us. The beeswax and the dyer's wood we carried being both lighter than water. The Greyhound was so swamped with water that we surely would have sunk if it were not for the flotation of the cargo itself. But was God's hand not present even in this detail? As we limped back toward England, crippled with only a few sails, I spent most of my time reading the scriptures, meditating, and praying to the Lord for mercy and instruction. I began to see my life in a different perspective. The burning anger that had driven me as a younger man was now faded. I began to see that my entire life was that of the parable of the prodigal son, not in a figurative way, as most people understand it, but in the most literal reality. Land ho! We sighted land on April 7th, the Irish island of Tory. The next day, we landed at Swilly. Finally, I was safely home after misadventures that seemed like a storybook. So, did you see your father? No. See, God's ways are very strange. You see, the day I arrived in Liverpool, I discovered that my father had shipped out only the day before for Canada. He'd been appointed governor of York's Fort in Hudson Bay Colony. I never saw him again. How sad. Did he know that you were saved? Oh, yes. Uh, we were able to write one another, so he knew the whole story. But he died there in Canada and was buried there, and I never saw him again. However, God gave me a new father, as it were, Joseph Manistee, who owned the ship that I had returned on, took me under his wing and treated me as if I were his own son. He got me a commission as first mate on a trade ship, and I did very well. Much of the rebellion in my spirit, the burning anger, had been washed away in Africa, and I no longer found myself always attracted to trouble. My new station in life secure, I could at long last go back to Kent and to my Polly, my beloved Polly. After years of remembering her face as in a dream, I was finally able to marry my dear Polly, the love of my life. According to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I give thee my truth. With this ring let me wear, with my body let me worship, and with all of my worldly goods I give thee now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, Before long, my benefactor Joseph Manesty promoted me to captain, captain of my own ship, the Duke of Argyle. The Duke of Argyle was a slaving ship. So my job as captain was to take the ship to the west coast of Africa, 
very close to where I had been held captive myself, pick up slaves there, transport them to the West Indies, there to exchange them for molasses and rum and return those to England. That's why we call it the triangular trade. Wait, you are a captain of a slave ship? After you were a slave yourself? How could you do that? You're a very astute young man. No, I was an infant in the faith, and I really did not see the evils of the slave trade at the time. None of us did. It was considered an honorable way to make a living. But you were held captive. How could you do that to someone else? It was all too easy. You see, attitudes are starting to change now, but 20 years ago, no one questioned the slave trade, well, save the Quakers and a few Moravian missionaries in St. Thomas. Everyone in England that had any money at all had it invested in the slave trade. It was very profitable. And where profit is concerned, we turn a blind eye, don't we? All I could see at the time was that as a Christian ship captain, my job was to safely transport the slaves from one port to the other and treat them as well as possible, the same as I might do with a load of cattle. It wasn't uncommon on slave ships for almost a third of them to die on that middle passage. They were kept chained below decks, fed little food. I prided myself on the fact that only a few had ever died on my ships. I devised a routine of regular exercise for the slaves so that each day they would see the sunlight and keep themselves as fit and healthy as possible. I insisted with Mr. Manistee that we have sufficient provisions so that the slaves could maintain proper nourishment and not arrive starved. I did the same with the crew. I was proud that my ship had one of the best records for delivering slaves in good health. We only had a few deaths at sea. I felt each one personally and worked harder on each voyage to make sure that both crew and cargo stayed healthy and fit. It may not seem like much, but it was far more than most captains did in those days. I engaged the crew in regular times of worship. Ye shall have a song, as in the night when a holy solemnity is kept, and gladness of heart as when one goeth with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel. Let us pray. It was on this journey that I had the chance to return to the Banana Islands, to my own place of enslavement. I was even able to find one of the lime trees that I had planted with my own hands so many years before. Then came my third voyage in 1753 as captain of the African. We landed in Ghana to pick up a load of 600 slaves for transport to Jamaica.
It was on that voyage that I began to first wonder about the slave trade. last voyage. Weather looks good. We we'll sail the day after tomorrow. I shall miss you terribly. I so wish you did not have to be gone so long. Yes, I know. But it is the nature of the trade. John? I'm afraid he suffered a stroke. I could no longer command a ship. How sad. It seemed very hard at the time, but we were later to understand that it was a blessing from God. A blessing? Yes, a blessing. You see, when God closes one way, it is often for a reason that we do not know or understand. Captain Potter, the man who took over the ship for me, and his entire crew were killed on that voyage. God, preserve us! Yes, he did preserve us. And it was a deep lesson, because what we thought was a curse at the time actually was filled with much grace. We moved back to Polly's family home in Kent for my recuperation. During this time, living in Kent, I had many hours of leisure, which I often spent outdoors. I had hours and hours for Bible study and for meditation. I spent many hours discovering the layers of grace present in our Lord's redeeming work. Slowly I regained some of my strength, but I knew I would never again captain a ship. However, my knowledge of the business enabled me to obtain a position as Tide Surveyor of Liverpool, a position of great responsibility. Ahoy! Tidepool Surveyor, state your cargo. One hundred barrels of rum and a hundred barrels of molasses from the island. I worked for the customs office and was responsible to inspect incoming ships to make sure that proper import customs were paid to the government. Even with the remaining weakness from my stroke, I could still discharge the work with responsibility and yet have the free time to study the scriptures as I desired. Now that we were settled in a house in Liverpool, I made the most of my free time. I determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, and I resolved to do nothing that would not serve that main purpose. I began to learn Greek, enough to allow me to understand the New Testament and the Septuagint, and then I began studying Hebrew the following year. I never attained a critical skill in any of these languages, but I had no goal but to truly and faithfully understand the scriptural words and phrases so that I could judge for myself the meaning of any particular passage. Together with this, I kept up a course of reading the best writers of Christian theology I could find. Out of this gradually arose a new desire. My mother's hope when I was a child was that I should enter the ministry. Now, for the first time, I began to feel a strong calling in that direction myself. It was not a calling of which I felt worthy, but I felt in some ways I was the perfect person to proclaim the faithful saying from 1 Timothy, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save the chief of sinners. 
My life had been full of such remarkable turns. I seemed selected to show what the Lord could do. My initial enthusiasm was damped by refusal after refusal to consider me for ordination. I did not give up easily, but in rapid order I was turned down by the established church, by the dissenters, by the Methodists, and by the Presbyterians. Though not yet ordained, I began to preach at churches around Liverpool and to be well received. The Lord bestows many blessings upon his people. But unless he likewise gives them a thankful heart, they lose much of the comfort they might have in them. And this is not only a blessing in itself, but an earnest of more. King David, when he was peacefully settled in his kingdom, purposed to express his gratitude by building a place for the ark. I began to receive more and more invitations to preach or to speak about my life experiences. Polly, Polly, read this. You're to be the pastor of the parish church of St. Peter and St. Paul and only? Oh, John, it is an answer to our prayers. I had to wait over seven long years, but finally my dream to serve as a parish pastor would become true. And that, Samuel, is how I came to be the pastor of this parish. Of course, that was a number of years ago before you were born. It is quite a story. Yes, and let it be a lesson to you. For the story that God has in mind for you may be very different from what you have planned. The great adventure is finding God's will for your life. Oh, I did not know you had company. <laughs> yes, this is Samuel we met in the village. Oh, aren't you Mrs. Watson's oldest? Aye, she's me stepmom. <laughs> Why don't you join us on Tuesday? John and I have begun a Bible school for the area children. Yes, you'll improve your reading skills and at the same time learn more about the Bible. If you're leading it, then I'll come. Oh, very good. <laughs> Yes, John, please remember that William Cowper is coming later to work on the poem. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cowper and I are working on some spiritual poems which can be sung to popular tunes like uh, uh, Black Eyed Susan or Mad Robin. I know them! Of course you do. <laughs> you must be off now. Mr. Newton and Mr. Cowper have some very important work to do. Mr. Newton? Yes? Thanks for telling me your story. Well, thank you for listening, Samuel. And you'll be here on Tuesday. Aye. I'll be here on Tuesday. Very good. Very good. Yes, here. Read it. John Newton Clark, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long laboured to destroy. He changed my life. A few years later, he was called the St. Mary Wall of the Church in London. When I was old enough, I joined him there. Through him, I met William Wilberforce and joined the movement to abolish the slave trade. It took years. 
the bill passed Parliament in 1807, the same year that Mr. Newton died. And the same year that you were born, Alexandria. But he lived to see the abolition of the slave trade. Oh, so he did it? Not he alone, but many working together. He did change the world. And he changed one life. The life of a little boy who was hurt and angry at the world. He taught me something of gentleness and of God's grace. And I hope you have a chance to learn of that grace as well.